Good morning and welcome to the 16th meeting of 2014 of the Public Audit Committee. Uh, I have apologies from uh, James Dornan and David Torrance who is attending in his place and also apologies from Tavish Scott. Um, item 1, oh, sorry, can I just remind everyone to make sure that uh, electronic devices are either switched off or switched to a mode that doesn't interfere with the, the recording equipment. Thank you. Um, item 1 on the agenda, can we agree to take items 5, 6 and 7 in private? Thank you. Item 2 on our agenda, uh, continuing our evidence uh, sessions on uh, the Section 23 report on accident and emergency performance update. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Paul Gray, who's the Director General, Health and Social Care, and also the Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, John Conaghan, Director of Health, Workforce and Performance, uh, John Matheson, who's the Director of Finance, E-Health and Pharmaceuticals, uh, Professor Jason Leach, uh, who's the Clinical Director uh, of the Quality Unit, and Dr Aileen Keogh, who's the Acting Chief Medical Officer of the Scottish Government. Uh, welcome. Uh, Mr Gray, I don't know if you or any of your colleagues wish to make an open statement. A brief statement, convener, if that's acceptable. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before the committee today. And I wanted to say in, in opening that um, we take this issue of uh, A&E performance very seriously. And that's why I've uh, asked a number of senior colleagues to uh, come with me uh, to bring to bear their expertise in different aspects of this issue. The helpful evidence taken by this committee from the Auditor General and, and from NHS Scotland senior leaders and clinicians last week has, I think, emphasised the complexity of the system within which unscheduled care operates. This complexity isn't unique to Scotland. Unscheduled care performance was affected during winter 2012-13 in other parts of the UK and in similar health systems across the world. Our approach in Scotland to tackling the issues related to unscheduled care is set in our overall vision that by 2020 more people will be living longer, healthier lives in home or a homely setting. So we do want to do all that we can to ensure that when people attend accident and emergency they get the right care from the right person within the standards we set. That already happens in many cases but we want it to happen consistently. But sometimes it will be better for people to get the care they need elsewhere in a minor injuries unit, for example, or via an out-of-hours primary care service or through telephone advice. Again, that's happening in some cases, but there is best practice that we can spread further, which will provide improved outcomes for patients and reduce costs. I thought it would be helpful to comment briefly on the phrase A&E weights. What we are measuring is progress against a target that by September of this year 95% of patients would be seen in as appropriate, either treated or discharged within four hours of arrival at A&E. We're not measuring whether patients wait for four hours. We're measuring whether they're out of accident and emergency with all clinically appropriate actions taken within four hours. As I've made clear in earlier correspondence, I welcome the recommendations within Audit Scotland's report published in May of this year, and we're progressing these through our unscheduled care action plan. Uh, this plan is supported by local unscheduled care action plans, which each board prepares annually. I'll mention briefly some of the key actions taken in the first year of the action plan. We've established the flow programme to improve the way that patients move through the system and cut out unnecessary delays. We've recruited an additional 18 emergency department consultants. We've put in additional bed capacity. We've issued signposting guidance to help patients uh, be directed to the most appropriate treatment point. We've got a number of uh, new initiatives um, preventing frail elderly patients going into hospital unnecessarily in Forth Valley and Ayrshire and Arran. Discharge hubs in Fife, Lothian and Ayrshire and Arran. We've invested in theatres in Grampian, in beds in NHS Lothian and in staffing in NHS Lanarkshire. Over the period November 2013 to March 2014, NHS Scotland recorded 93.1% performance for patients being discharged or admitted within four hours, compares with 91.4% over the same period in the previous year. And uh, I think the uh, figure of 94% has been quoted in relation to June in published data. But we're not at the standard we have set. I quite accept that, and I want to ensure that patients 
who do attend a and &E are able to leave a and &E safely within that standard. That's the commitment we've made, and despite the complexities, it's the one we're continuing to strive for. We've also reduced uh, significantly the number of people waiting over eight on 12 hours to be discharged or admitted. Again, we want, we want to eliminate that as far as possible. Um, we don't believe that uh, people should have to wait uh, as long as that to be admitted or discharged, uh, certainly in very few cases, but fewer than 1% of all patients um, remained longer than eight hours in accident and emergency. But we do owe it to patients to go further where we can. So, in uh, closing, I want to assure the committee that we're well aware that the context that we are seeking to deliver, the, in which we're seeking to deliver these commitments, is challenging. I'm not here to provide um, a, a set of emollient statements about how it's all absolutely fine. There are places where it is not. Um, We've got an ageing population, increases in patients presenting with more than one condition, often referred to as multimorbidity and recruitment pressures. They're not unique to Scotland, but nevertheless, we're committed to doing all that we can for the people served by NHS Scotland to provide timely treatment so that they experience safe, person-centred and effective care and enjoy good health outcomes. Happy to answer the committee's questions, convener. If we don't have data uh, immediately to hand, we'll undertake to provide it as quickly as possible. I know you've had a lot of detailed information and we would want to make sure that any responses we gave in that context were accurate. So if we don't have it today, we'll provide it as soon as we can. Thank okay. you for allowing me to make a statement. Thank you very much for that. Uh, you recognise in your opening statement, Mr Gray, that um, you're not yet meeting uh, the 98 per cent standard or, or, or target, but you talked about the milestones. Um, have you reached the 95 per cent performance milestone in September? Uh, as you'll appreciate, convener, that da these data won't be published until the end of uh, December, I think. Is it? Uh, no, the, it's uh, two months after the period ends. Yeah, two months after the period ends, so if it's September, then it will be November. Um, so until we've got that ratified data, I can't confirm that. Are you confident that you will reach at least 95 per cent? Well, on the basis of um, advice from boards, I think a number of them will. I can't say that they all will. And until we have the data, I wouldn't want to make a firm statement about that. OK. Um, Dr Martin McEachan, who's the new chair of the College of Emergency Medicine in Scotland, has acknowledged that the additional £50 million pounds um, that the Scottish Government invested um, had helped to, uh, I think it was in his words or the words of the journalist, curb a, a crisis. But he then went on to say um, that there are still unresolved serious issues. Do you accept that? Well, I accept that, uh, for example, as the committee heard uh, last week in Grampian, there is, that there, is a, there is an issue with staffing and emergency medicine. Um, I've acknowledged that, that, that not everywhere is perfect, and I have no difficulty, convener, in accepting that in some pockets there are and have been and will continue to be difficulties. There was uh, information in the public domain recently about a day when uh, Hare Meyer's uh, accident emergency, I think, dipped below 70 per cent in relation to the target on uh, account of a very high attendance uh, unexpectedly on that day, out with all the norms. We, we, we are not in a situation where um, every day will be absolutely perfect. You mentioned Lanarkshire, and, and, and last week we heard evidence from um, a number of boards, <coughs> including NHS Lanarkshire. And it was interesting, one of the things I, th I suspect the committee will want to look at more closely um, is how we, we share good practice, how problems are certainly identified, but how we share good practice. And we heard from uh, NHS Tayside um, about efforts they were making to ensure that um, patients or people weren't um, unnecessarily attending A&E when they could be treated elsewhere. Um, we, we also heard from NHS Lanarkshire that um, they were quite confident that they could sustain the present uh, accident and emergency uh, configuration. But since then, I've seen correspondence which suggests that, for example, um, the GP out of our service um, in, in, in Lanarkshire 
um, we're solving problems. Um, I think, I don't know if this is it five units that there are in, in Lanarkshire, uh, and a couple of them had to be had to be closed. Now, where the GP out of our service is unable to cope, I think we heard a certain concern that the public would make its own decision. Um, Mary Scanlon, I think, identified uh, a, a number of areas in the country where it would appear that the public were just attending A&E because they felt that that was probably the easiest and quickest way um, to receive a service. Now, in, in areas like Lanarkshire, if the GP out of our service is unable to cope because of lack of staff, does that then not place uh, a huge burden on an already overstretched accident and emergency service? If a particular aspect of the service in any board uh, stops working for a period of time, then clearly that demand goes elsewhere. Um, I think that uh, Ms Scanlon, I think, made uh, some important points about the choices that individuals make based on uh, their, their perception of where they're most likely to get uh, a service. One of the things about the National Health Service uh, is that we never, uh, nor should we, refuse to provide a service. So if, if uh, someone can't get a service through the GP out of hours, then they will have a choice of phoning NHS 24, um, they will have a choice of attending accident emergency or, in extreme cases, um, phoning an ambulance. These choices will remain available and clearly that pressure will displace from the service that isn't available onto the ones that are. Uh, that, that's, that is a fact of the way the NHS operates in Scotland. Okay. Mary Scanlon. <coughs> Thank you for that. Um, last, the, the report that we're looking at uh, uh, today is about uh, Audit Scotland Accident and Emergency. So we couldn't ask Audit Scotland what was happening with the uh, ambulance service, NHS 24, and why two out of three people presenting at accident and emergency were self-referring. Uh, but I do feel that that's a question that we can ask you. Now, overall, the increase in patients in the past four years uh, over the overall is 50,000. But if you look at, if you drill down slightly, at Nine Wells Hospital, it's down by 46. But if you look at Aberdeen, it's up by six, nearly 63,000. Edinburgh is up by 112, and Glasgow's up by 85. Now, is it not a case that, uh, you know, what are you doing to find out why there's this huge increase in self-referral? Because my, my point is we no longer have an accident and emergency service. We have a 24-7 open door to the NHS, which quite rightly, patients are now saying, this is where I choose to go. And maybe it is because they're getting there uh, what they're perhaps not getting elsewhere. So what are you, I mean, if this continues at this rate, <laughs> we no longer have an accident and emergency service and the GPs are, well, it would seem that GPs are doing less and less and patients are voting with their feet uh, to go to A&E. So what are you doing about NHS 24, GP referral and the two thirds, 66% of patients at A&E that are self-referring. Is that really an accident and emergency service anymore? Well, a number of comments, and I, I will bring co colleagues in on, on, on this as to some of the wider work that we're doing. First of all, um, I, am, I, I am very reluctant to, uh, and I'm not suggesting you're doing this, Ms Scanlon, I'm very reluctant to criticise a patient for making a choice that might not actually be the best one for them. Uh, but what I am seeking to do, and colleagues are too, and we, uh, perhaps um, I could bring colleagues in on the NHS 24 uh, campaign that will be running in terms of helping people to understand over the winter uh, what, uh, what the most appropriate routes to treatment might be. What we are seeking to do is to work to educate the public on what would be best for them. Because actually, in some cases, going to A&E is not best, but it's the only option that they believe to have available to them. Now, um, I've been speaking to uh, both NHS 24 and the Ambulance Service about what more we can do to help 
the public to understand where they're most likely to get the best outcome. They may very well get a good outcome from going to accident emergency, but they may have got a quicker outcome by going through another route. Um, they may very well feel that they ought to go to accident emergency for the want of quick advice that might have given them sufficient reassurance to wait until the following day until they could have gone to a GP. These things are all possible. Um, one of the things that the data pointed up to me, and I was discussing this with colleagues yesterday, was um, we're not yet very good at collecting information from patients about why they made the choice they did. So we know they made the choice but we're not always sure why. So um, I uh, took the, the, the time to go around uh, with the ambulance service and to be in uh, the NHS 24 control centre. And particularly in relation to the ambulance service, it was clear to me that some patients were calling for an ambulance because they were afraid and they had legitimate reasons to be afraid. But actually, if we'd had a different source of assurance and advice to these patients, it may well have been that their anxiety levels would have gone down and we would have been able to provide um, a service to them in a different way. The same, I think, happens in A&E, but for the want of data, Ms Scanlon, I'm not going to make an absolute judgment about why it is people turn up to A&E and why they don't. You're right, however, to say that some presentations to A&E could be dealt with elsewhere. That's why we're doing what we're doing, for example, in minor in injuries units, which allow someone with a minor, in minor injury to have a different uh, source of advice and treatment if necessary. But I don't know, Aileen, whether you want to say something. Data here. At Nine Wells Hospital, 50% of patients at A&E self-refer. In Aberdeen, it's 74 there are others like Heer Myers that are over 80, etc. So why is it that 50% of patients at Nine Wells, where we see as a beacon of good practice, and we welcome that, and why is it that 75, and I just pick out Aberdeen because they were here last week, so we've got 25% more presentations at accident and emergency in Aberdeen that self-refer than we do at Nine Wells. Why is that? Ms Scanlon, I'm not saying we don't have the data. What we don't have is the underlying information that tells us why the patient made that choice. Now, it may be that in Aberdeen they made the choice because there aren't facilities available in Aberdeen that are available in Dundee, for example. But we haven't asked the patients, so we don't know. And my point is, I am drawing from these data the fact that we need to have a better understanding not just of the facilities available, but of why patients make the choices they do. And that's what I'm keen to pursue um, in, uh, as we go forward. But Dr Keel may be able to add. Uh, th thanks, but I mean, I, I think that's right. We do not understand why people are making these choices. We need to, to get a better understanding. There's a, a graph in the Audit Scotland report that I'm struggling to find, but it talks about um, board usage of A&E and minor injuries units. And it's very interesting because it's clear. Five. Thank you very much, Ms. Gellin. Well, I don't know if that's hmm. the one, but it's, uh, it's exhibit four. Exhibit four. Um, and, and I think, again, oh, yeah. we, were, we were talking yesterday about why there's this enormous variation between boards in terms of use of minor injuries units, which are there on the, on, on the board territory. Um, but clearly patients are choosing more to go to A&E. So I think we need to gather a bit more intelligence around this and be begin to better understand why these choices are being made. Okay, okay well, if you don't understand it, we're not going to get much further there. But I, would have, I was hoping that we would have got a more holistic picture from the health service today than we were... Could we, we, it would be... It would be wrong to ask Audit Scotland about the ambulance service and others when they only look to A&E, but under, uh, underlying this report is what's happening at GPs, NHS 24 and the ambulance service, and that's why I'm keen to understand that. So until we understand that, we don't know why hundreds of th uh, two, two out of three patients self-refer, and they're doing that for a reason, and we have to respect that reason. Indeed. Can I, I'd like to bring, uh, if I may... Professor Leach in on this, but I think I think just to be clear, I'm accepting the point that we need better to understand why patients do what they do, um, and 
it has not been our approach so far to collect much data on that, and I believe we ought to, because that is the way we will be able to modify what we're doing. Um, if it's all right, can we bring Professor Leach in? Uh, good morning. Uh, a, c a couple of things, Ms Scanlon. You, you referred to Exhibit 3 and Exhibit 5, so let, let me uh, deal with Exhibit 3, first of all. That's the difference in attendances between 0809 and 1213. It, it's two data points. It's a before-after data points. I, it, we need to see the trend rather than these. There are some interesting things about this data. Oh, for in, indeed. So Glasgow Royal Infirmary, which would appear to have the second highest increase, that's because Stob Hill Hospital closed its A&E during that time, and Glasgow Royal Infirmary absorbed all of the Stob Hill accident emergency patients. The Victoria Infirmary, where I did most of my training and most of my surgery, is, has the second lowest. So it says it reduced its attendances by 61,000, but that's because they opened a minor injuries unit and took all the people who they used to count as A&E attendances into minor injury units. So th this doesn't give you the overall trend. The overall trend for the whole country is 150,000 people a month, and it's roughly stable. That doesn't deal with your where they're going and the holistic care point, which I completely agree with, that we should give the most appropriate care to the people in the right place at the right time. The data in Exhibit 5, I think, is what would be the best description? Weak, perhaps? I don't think we code this particularly well in the National Health Service. It, just to take your two hospitals that you used as examples, Nine Wells and Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, as 50% self-referral and 75% self-referral, it also says that Nine Wells Hospitals got 27% of people coming in 999 ambulances and Aberdeen Royal Infirmary having 7.2% coming in 99 ambulances. That can't be true. So they're being coded di differently. So y these are two major district general hospitals, one with a third of its patients coming in ambulances and one with 7% of its patients coming in ambulances. So this data is not coded well by the, by the health service. Okay, I, I'm only deputy convener, but can I just say that that did come up with Audit Scotland last week, and it's very difficult for us to do the job when we don't have uh, accurate, comparable data. Uh, I mean, I can only work on what's in front of me, but Audit Scotland did say that the data was not comparable, so yeah. it's, I'll leave that one to the convener. But, but Professor uh, Leach, you know, you say that the data is weak. Now, that's not the fault of Audit Scotland. They can only compile what is presented to them. If the data is weak, then that's the fault of the NHS. That's the fault of the health department. That's not Audit Scotland's responsibility. Right. So the question is, why have you collectively not sorted out the presentation of weak data in order to allow Audit Scotland and the behalf of the public yeah. to do an effective job? Yeah. So what? To answer that. Because these data, uh, convener, are not uh, routinely collected data for publication subject to the um, standards and strictures that we'd apply. However, just in the interest of transparency, I discussed Exhibit 5 with colleagues here yesterday and said that I was clear that when I see chief executives this afternoon, we given that we've got some of these data and given that it tells us that there is differential uh, approaches to collecting it, uh, we're going to have to improve that. I, I'm not hiding behind the, the, the data. It was given to Audit Scotland. There is no criticism intended or implied of Audit Scotland in this presentation. But we did what we could with what we had available. If we are asked for new information that we don't routinely co collect, for publication, then it is generally going to be of a lower standard. Sure, sure I, I understand that. But, you know, you, this is not anything new. This is something that's done on a semi-regular basis. The report that we've got was a performance update. It wasn't right. the initial report. So this is something that you've known about for some considerable time. So why is it only taken to a discussion yesterday for you to raise this this afternoon to say that, yes, there is a serious problem here with statistics. Well, there isn't a serious problem with published well, statistics. So the data is not weak? The data is weak. But these so are that's not, not serious.
If there was a serious problem with routinely published statistics, that would be a very significant issue. If we're asked for something on an ad hoc basis, we do our best to provide it. That's what we did. If, and I'm not saying you are saying this, convener, if the committee would prefer that if we're asked for data, if we, we, will, we will stick only to data which is routinely published and subject to the quality controls that that has, we will do it. But I don't think that would be a service to the committee. And it, I'm simply telling you that I'm taking it up with chief executives this afternoon yeah. because we have a meeting with them then. This issue was clear to us some months ago. We've been, we've been working at it. I've got to the point where I want to speak to chief executives about it. It would not be appropriate for the committee to tell you which set of data to collect and which not to collect. Um, that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to analyse and comment on reports produced by, the Audit, by Audit Scotland on behalf of the Auditor General. It's Audit Scotland that asks you for information. Um, so I think there's a discussion clearly that you need to have with Audit Scotland, but I am surprised that you're saying that in this report, which is a performance update, we have a set of statistics which you say are not routinely collected and which would appear to me to be part and parcel of an ongoing observation on the performance of accident and emergency. Now, that's something that we can explore later uh, with the Auditor General about whether or not this set of statistics is unusual and therefore uh, subject to the, the, the kind of weaknesses that, that, that you've described, or whether it's something that has been going on for some time, in which case it does seem surprising that it's only now that the, the problem is, is, is being addressed. But can I ask you one other thing before I bring... Um, I've just got sorry. One question to ask. All right, OK. No, yeah. just when you're... Well, 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 no, no, it was a slightly... A different issue on, on ambulance service and, and, and accident emergency, but you go first. No, my only now. question, it's just my final, I only had two questions, and the, and the second one was a point raised by the medical director from Aberdeen, and it was about the NRAC figures and previously Arbuthnot. I don't have the figures in front of me, but I do remember, uh, and they were accurate. Um, but uh, per capita, uh, Nine Wells gets 1,945-ish, and Aberdeen gets 1,500. So for every single person in NHS Grampian, they are funded at £500 less than a patient in Tayside. So really, are they being punished for being the oil capital? Are they, you know, is the NRAC formula, and I remember our Arbuthnot 1 and our Arbuthnot 2 and all that, you know, is the NRAC formula appropriate? Are we really funding Grampian appropri appropriately enough to provide the service that we can be we can easily criticise them for doing? Just to look at that formula, because it was raised. Well, I'll, I'll bring John Matheson in on the point, Ms Scanlon, but to be absolutely clear, since you've asked the direct question, no, NHS Grampian are not being punished for anything. less per person funding. Well, Mr Matheson will explain the formula. Ms Cameron, the, the formula starts with its basis, the population of the individual health board areas. It's then adjusted for age and sickness. Head of population. It's, it's based on population. It's then adjusted for age and sex. It's adjusted for morbidity and life circumstances. And then there's an excess cost index brought in to, re to recognise remoteness and rurality. It's a dynamic formula. It's continually under review. We've just uh, reviewed data, remoteness and rurality. So what the results are telling you is that the population of NHS Grampian overall is, uh, requires less demand on the, the, the healthcare service than the other parts of the, the, the country. The, we do recognise, as, as part of the, the movement towards NRAP parity, that not all boards are at parity, and, and Grampian is one of the boards that is uh, below parity at this point in time. And we have an agreed uh, way forward over the next two years to bring NHS Grampian and uh, the other boards that are below parity to within the 1% of parity by the start of 2016-17. So the difference that you've highlighted, Ms Scanlon, is a difference that is driven by the, the, the formula, which is a formula that was agreed across the, the NHS and is uh, under a continuous review to make sure that it is appropriate and uh, up to date. 
the, the, this is a complex and complicated issue, um, and I think it's one for separate discussion at, uh, at another time. It's no doubt something that we can come back to for that Scotland um, do produce a report on that. Can I just ask you a question um, that, that comes to mind? Um, what both what Mary Scanlon said, uh, and, and you mentioned, Mr. Gay, it's, it's about the connection between the different services. Um, you've got a target of four hours, um, which you're aspiring to, and you know, which you, you admit will be challenging. Um, I, I've got a, an inquiry from a, a constituent uh, about the ambulance service, and no doubt others will have had similar inquiries. Um, the, women's, the women had to wait seven hours for the ambulance to arrive. Now, when she gets to accident emergency, the clock starts at that point for the four hours. But potentially, it's 11 hours from her reporting an issue to her being through the system. Is that, is that acceptable? Without knowing the detail of the individual case, no, 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 convener... No, sorry, I, I wouldn't expect you no. to do that. I'm just talking about the concept of a four-hour target, but actually uh, the, the reality is that it's potentially 11 hours. Well, as I say, I, I wouldn't like to draw too many conclusions from an individual case where the, the wait for the ambulance does sound long. Uh, uh, but um, I think one of the important things in terms of the, the way we're, we're trying to uh, help the public better to understand what we do is that very often, in, particularly in a serious case, if an ambulance uh, arrives with uh, qualified clinicians, um, the definitive care to the patient starts at the point when the ambulance arrives, not at the point that the person gets to A&E, there is still, I think, something of a mental model in the minds of the public. And, and I would accept responsibility for that, that the job of the ambulance is to pick you up and take you to A&E as fast as possible. In fact, definitive care is delivered um, you know, at the roadside, in the home of the patient, uh, and, and that is the life-saving care that is often delivered, the point at which these uh, qualified uh, ambulance practitioners, paramedics, decide to take the patient to hospital is informed by their assessment of the clinical condition. So I think it is right that we have a target for the ambulance service to arrive based on the category of the call, and then we have a, 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 a target in relation to performance at A&E. Um, of, the, of the cases that I uh, was privileged to be part of in my uh, short time going around with the ambulance service. In fact, only one case was taken to A&E out of five. The, the care was delivered to the person in their home, or as I say, by the roadside, um, and there was no requirement to go to A&E. So I don't think we could join the two together. Uh, Colin Beatty and then Ken McIntosh. I do have to comment on the data collection because this committee has again and again come up against deficiencies across the board on data protection, uh, data collection. This, uh, this report that we have in front of us is almost entirely data driven and the conclusions that we take from it are entirely dependent on the quality of the information that's provided. And it is a concern that there are inconsistencies across the service which make it difficult to do comparisons or to draw the conclusions that maybe we would need to, and you, obviously that's something that um, I'm sure you're going to address. I hope so. Yes, as I've already said in response to the convener, um, there are, there are, for published data there are standards uh, and these have to be uh, upheld and maintained. Um, and, well, we seek to be transparent, so if we hold some information, we will give it with the caveat that it may be partial, it may be incomplete, but we're not... We're not in the business of withholding what we know, even if what it tells us is we need to get better. Just moving on, the previous it was said that the Scottish Government uh, was encouraging NHS boards to make use of the emergency departments and emergency medical workload tool. How widely used is that and what conclusions have been drawn from the use of it? Well, I'll ask Dr Keel to help me out with that one because um, that's a... That's a level of detail that I'm not personally familiar with. Well, <clears throat> the short answer is I don't know how widely it's used. We're certainly promoting it as, as a means of measuring workload, which, of course, isn't just related to the volume of patients coming through the door, 
but the case mix and the severity of, of the, the, the conditions that those patients are suffering from. But I think John Conachan probably can say a bit more about how widely it's being implemented. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, the tool is currently still under development. We've reached the later stages of development. We have piloted it now on a number of boards and um, the plan is um, in 2015, as early as we can, that we start to roll that out on a national basis. Um, it's a different kind of workload tool than we've used in the past. Most of the workload tools that we've developed, and, and Scotland leads the way in this, I must say, from a UK perspective, have been devoted more to nursing staff. Uh, this one in accident emergency takes all the staff that work in there, doctors, um, AHPs and, um, and nurses. So that's why it's um, uh, taken a little longer than we would otherwise like in terms of the development phase. But we've done a lot of work on that. It is breaking, as I say, UK ground, but 2015 is a plan for us to, to roll out. And I, I don't have the rollout schedule um, to hand at this stage, but I, I can supply more information on that if needed. Ian, it's already been highlighted that a &E has a substantial number of uh, people self-referring. Uh, however accurate these figures are, there's certainly a substantial number. And the comments have already been made that for a lot of these patients there could have been alternatives, uh, alternative uh, solutions for them. Now, clearly, a lot of these patients are going to be signposted away to other services, for example, primary care and so forth. How confident are we that there's sufficient capacity within these other areas, such as primary care, to deal with the patients that you're signposting on? Uh, I'll, I'll pick that one up if I could. Um, one of the things that we've established um, in the last couple of years is uh, a requirement for each board to produce a local unscheduled care action plan. That local unscheduled care action plan um, where we're now in our second year, um, should take account of the demand and capacity in each of the parts of the system which is um, uh, which supports unscheduled care. So the answer is um, uh, it's very much for local boards to determine, but we've set up a national mechanism that um, says that you must do this. And um, these local unscheduled care action plans are indeed published on each board's website. When you say it, it's up to the, to the local boards, um, is there some sort of uh, consistency of approach there? Are there guidelines that yeah, um, they will have to follow? Uh, we have um, uh, uh, we we issue guidance on, an, on a, an annual basis. We continuously refresh that guidance with our partners, for instance, the College of Emergency Medicine, um, to make sure it's accurate and up to date. So yes, we do issue national guidance on that. We call that the National Unscheduled Care Action Plan. Thank you. Okay, then. Hey, thank you, Kevin, and uh, uh, good morning. I, I think most of us were um, uh, uh, very worried by this report when we first saw it. I mean, it shows that Scotland's performance uh, against the E&E target has deteriorated over the last four years, and we've spent some time trying to work out some of the main reasons why that might be the case to make sure that that's being addressed. And we had a very um, frank, very good discussion last week, I have to say, with a number of colleagues from the NHS, um, in which we touched upon uh, staffing, delayed discharge, sustainable issue, sustainability issues and others. But there's one particular issue, which I'd like to start with, if I may, which emerged. And it started for, uh, was there a comment from Professor Ferguson, who's an emergency consultant, consultant at NHS Grampian, and he said, um, he said, we still operate the way we have always operated. We know that people are more likely to die if they go into hospital at, at weekend. There is good evidence to suggest that. And then... Um, I followed that up because I've asked the, the Health Secretary, Alan Neal, about this, and he says there's no evidence to suggest this. Um, Dr uh, Dykusen, who's the medical director, uh, said, uh, I agree with Ken McIntosh that because those studies, these are international studies which show this, uh, that there's a, 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 an issue at weekends, I agree with Ken McIntosh that because these studies show such a relationship, we should assume that the effects are the same in our country and our organisations. That's why we do these studies, to learn in order to, what to focus on. And then Professor Ferguson later suggested, uh, uh, again, when he was questioned again by the convener on this, what I, what I am saying is that there is international evidence that backs up uh, that that happens. I would surmise from that that we have the same problem in Scotland. Otherwise, why we should need the safety programme. Um, can I ask Mr Gray first perhaps, what do you make of that? Do we have a problem with um, 
excess mortality uh, at weekends uh, in, in A and E departments or in, in hospitals generally? Well, the evidence we have um, doesn't actually tend to support that. And, and I mean, uh, Professor, you've quoted uh, colleagues saying that they assume. I, I'd like to ask Professor Leach to, to give us some insight into what the data uh, is and what it is telling us and what some of these international reports said. Um, I think, you, Mr McIntosh, you're asking a fair question, and we did anticipate it, so we've, we've done some work to prepare an answer. Um, Mr McIntosh and I have discussed this previously, and there, there was an FOI. So there, are, there is some Scottish evidence. There are, there are international studies which, which suggest increased mortality at the weekend and compared to weekdays. They, they don't tend to explain why. And they don't adjust for everything you can adjust for because it, it's very, very difficult because it could simply be that patients are sicker, the, they're more complex, there is more trauma, there is more alcohol use Friday and Saturday, etc. So there are two pieces of Scottish evidence. One is the Handel study, which was quoted last week, I think, and it's weekend admissions as an independent predictor of mortality and analysis of Scottish hospital admissions. Now, it doesn't adjust for admitting diagnosis. So it doesn't make any decision about what, why you came in. And it doesn't adjust for the severity of your diagnosis. So it doesn't tell us whether your stroke was very bad or your stroke was very mild. It goes on to say in the conclusions that it may be that emergency departments see a different, more unwell population of patients at the weekend, since in one study which used a biochemical measure of severity, adjustment for this variable rendered the weekend effect insignificant. This could mean that the effect we observe is actually due to admissions over the weekend comprising a more unwell population of patients who would suffer a higher rate of mortality regardless of factors that may apply exclusively to the weekend. Having had in your previous questions, both in the Parliament and to Mr Neil, uh, we asked uh, ISD to look at Scottish data in particular. You've had that FOI. It, it looked at all deaths from 1st January to 31st December 2012 by specialty. And... Of course, there is variation by day, there is variation by specialty, there is co constant variation. You, you don't get the same mortality rates all, all the time. But ISD say the assumption that mortality is higher for patients admitted at the weekend cannot be backed up by statistical evidence. The data only took the type of admission into account. To understand this issue fully, there are a number of factors, including case mix, age, and underlying health issues. So I'm not dismissive of the weekday, weekend mortality literature, but I'm passionate about mortality in the whole week. I'm passionate about expected mortality and what we're doing about that in Scotland's hospitals and that you won't be surprised for me to use the example of the Scottish Patient Safety Programme and that's why it exists. It exists on Mondays and on Saturdays and Sundays. It is about sepsis, it is about venous thromboembolism, it's about early warning scoring and your witnesses last week used it as an example of trying to fix the whole system all the time. And, and globally, it's, it's the best recognised safety programme in the world. And it, and it is about reducing mortality every day. So I'm, I'm not rejecting completely the weekday, weekend mortality thing, but I'm more focused on reducing unexpected mortality throughout the whole system. Okay. Can, I, can I thank you for that? And, uh, and also for uh, following up uh, this issue, because I think clearly if we don't agree... Um, or if there's not a shared uh, acceptance of the problem or identification of the problem, it's very difficult to address if we, if we, do, if we don't think it exists, as it were. Um, just picking up on those points, though, uh, the, the, the figures that you did publish through the FOI uh, were very welcome. Um, I, I was contacted, uh, I spoke to a number of people about this, but I was contacted by one, Professor uh, Paul Aylin, who is, uh, I think, the... Um, I don't know what he is, he's the... Uh, Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health, and he's co-director of the Dr. Foster Unit at Imperial College. So, and Dr. Foster Unit, I think, have been quite influential in, in changing health patterns in England, which I imagine why it matters to them. Uh, and he just, just his, his views on the, on the information that he published through the FOI. Uh, the document cited by, uh, by Mr. Neil, which claims to support the fact there is no excess mortality at weekends in Scotland, is inconclusive. The analysis as it stands breaks down the data into individual specialities by day of the week, and as such, the numbers are just too small to show an effect either way. Now, the key thing here is that uh, the BMG paper, which you quote from Dr Handel's paper, well, Dr Handel and lots of others, uh, 
you, you cited one of the um, uh, comments on it. The conclusion was actually there was a significant increased probability of death associated with a weekend emergency admission compared with admission on a weekday. Now, it did say, it did say that further research should be undertaken, but it showed other factors. It showed, for example, this was a, a study over 11 years, and it showed a decline in mortality over that. I mean, it, it, was, it was actually quite positive. It, it, it wasn't unremittingly negative about what was happening in Scotland, far from it. Um, but it did show that. And there have been other studies. Uh, Professor P uh, Aileen himself, along with others, uh, also published a, a weekend mortality for emergency admissions, a large multi-centre study, also showing uh, very similar uh, uh, differences between weekend and weekday admissions. And there have been international studies showing this. Now, the point here is that uh, in England, the NHS is addressing this as a, a specific, they're taking policy action to address uh, weekend mortality and readmission rates. They're, they're recognising it as an issue and they've uh, change the policy. Now, I'm not saying that we should. It could be that the patient safety programme, I'm not going that far. I'm just trying to work out whether or not um, we can actually conclude, as Mr Neil seems to suggest, that we have no problem at all. Now, the, the figures you suggested that you published in this FOI suggest that between 2009 and 2012, there's been a marked improvement. Because in, in, in this study, in 2000, the BMJ study and others, there was still quite a difference. There was a 40% increase, in, a 40% difference in excess deaths at weekend. Quite a marked, significant increase in deaths at weekends. If, you know, the, the figures now show there's no difference, can you actually point to the policy initiatives that have made the difference? Can you actually show or demonstrate what it is that's actually working? Because I think that's as important to us as whether it's, uh, you know, if it's actually happened, we should be welcoming it and celebrating it. We should also work out what has caused um, that beneficial effect. And, and I would suggest that this, this, the figures that you've studied, you've, you've published, don't actually prove anything. They just do not indicate, uh, they, they don't demonstrate there's a problem one way or another. Indeed. Preci precisely my point. The handle, the handle study, I, I'm not suggesting the handle study isn't telling the truth. The Handel study does show an odds ratio of 1.41 compared to we comparing weekends to weekdays. It doesn't, by its own admission, adjust for severity of diagnosis. So one of the conclusions you could draw is the patients at weekend are expected to die, for lack of a better description, because they are sicker than the ones during the week. It, we could isolate out Tuesdays if we wanted and spend all our time looking at the data on Tuesdays because we're worried about Tuesdays. I, I'm worried about mortality and the safety of our healthcare system every day, which is why the Scottish Patient Safety Programme and its interventions apply every single day. That doesn't mean that we're not tackling seven-day working and seven-day services, but these are not about mortality. They're about flow and care and getting people out, delayed discharge reduction. And inside that seven-day working, of course, is safe and effective and person-centred care at the same time. So we do have those policy initiatives that the English are having. I know of nothing in England specifically around the safety of care at weekends compared to weekdays. I do know they're up looking at the Scottish Patient Safety Programme and they're going to launch 15 of them in the regions, if they, can, if they can, around NHS England. So there's nothing in England that I've seen that says they're doing something special at weekends to reduce mortality compared to during the week. And I would, I would advise against specific interventions that would deal with safety on a weekend day that we wouldn't use on a Tuesday. And I, I don't know anywhere where, where that's true. That doesn't mean that we don't want to increase the use of diagnostics at the weekend to improve the flow, to increase the use of pharmacy at the weekend, and all of these other elements around our seven-day working service. Although the people at who the thousands of people who work this Saturday and Sunday already believe the National Health Service is a seven-day service. So let's not, let's not pretend we're not already working in a 24-7 environment inside the National Health Service. Just to, I don't want to spend over long on this issue, but I agree that this BMG paper <coughs> uh, you know, does not... Uh, we, we shouldn't draw the wrong conclusions from it. I mean, just as you were suggesting earlier from evidence in the uh, Audit Scotland report, Evidence uh, reveals problems. You don't necessarily want to draw the wrong conclusions from them. But the, the point I'm trying to work out is, first of all, do we accept or do we not accept that there is a difference in mortality at weekends compared to weekdays? Now, 
the professor, the, the doc, uh, uh, professor Ferguson, who gave evidence last week, believes there is. So he's consulted working in Grampian. He believes there is. So based, the based, suggests that's true. It suggests that's true as well. The same study, the Handel study, in the middle of it, it particularly says, he actually, they actually say, particularly influential to policies has been the report by Dr. Fosser. So this is a different report on an increased hospital mortality in the UK at weekends, which has been linked to a reduced cover by senior doctors at weekends. And that's a separate report. So Foster doesn't have Scottish data. That's exactly it. So yes. Foster only has, only has English that's data. It. So there, there are different reports from which you might draw different conclusions. Indeed. And uh, at this stage, I'm not even suggesting that we do draw these conclusions. I'm just trying to work out whether or not we accept <coughs> or believe there is a problem of increased mortality weekends. Because the answer from uh, Alan Neill suggested that there is no problem. He said there is no problem at weekends. We have, the, you know, don't... He actually accused me of scaremongering by saying, I wasn't scaremongering the slices. I was just trying to... I, I, well, I was actually coming from a constituent case and trying to work out whether the constituent's case was an individual case or typical of what would happen at weekends. And I was slightly worried, I have to say, I was struck by... What struck me as complacency on his behalf, if he thinks there is no problem based on a survey that's not peer-reviewed, that is statistically inconclusive, according to Professor Aylin, then that would really worry me if this is the one study that actually proves to Alec Neil that there's no problem at weekends. Can I ask you, for example, would it be possible to provide uh, Professor Aylin, Dr Foster, or any other uh, uh, medics, including Dr Handel and all the ones at the BMJ, with exactly the same evidence? Because they studied evidence from 2000 and... Uh, over 11 years up to 2009, would you be able to provide the same evidence um, breaking down, for example, not just uh, uh, weekend to weekday admissions, but uh, elective admissions um, and uh, basically something that can be comparable with a BMG paper so they can actually make the comparison? So ha Sir Hanlon has the Scottish data and he has as much of the Scottish data as available by all the countries. The difficulty is we don't... Me nobody measures severity of diagnosis. So nobody knows how sick the patients are when they arrive. So therefore, it's an it's an almost impossible to go, and that's because Hanlon's a very good researcher. If he had had severity of diagnosis data, he would have adjusted for it. He hasn't not done it because he forgot. He's not done it because that data is unavailable in all of our countries because we we don't have a neat measure of how sick you are when you come to A and E. So much of the assumption, having done safety across the whole nation, remember safety program every day, early warning scoring every day is that that safety system is in place on a Saturday and a Sunday as it is on a Monday. Now, it's not perfect. Sepsis care is not perfect. Infection care is not perfect. But, I, but my focus in leading the safety programme and the hundreds of people who are doing that is in, is in making that better every day. So that, that, that will need attention on a Saturday, but it will also need attention on a Tuesday. I'm not being critical of the safety programme. No, I, I, I understand. Anybody that. is. Uh, it's far from it. It's just trying to work out, is the safety programme by itself going to address the weekend issue? If you don't have, if the issue at weekends, if the issue at weekends is a lack of cover, because, and it's not a problem, it's, it's not, this is not a political issue, this is a, a reflection of society in five day uh, week. You know, it's not, it's not a reflection of a political government of the day, but it has to be addressed by the government of the day. So the patient safety programme addresses patient safety. It does not address weekend work. It does not address the issue of weekend working okay. and whether or not there's an issue with it. Correct. So the seven day, the, the, the work around seven day services mm -hmm. addresses the staffing, the diagnostics, the, all of the other elements. I am confident that patient safety is not affected on a weekend any more than it is in a weekday. However, the seven day working process is about making the system better, about making the service better. Not, not just about making the, the service safer. Hmm. So, so we've got a se you've got a seven day program, despite the fact that you don't think there's necessarily a problem with seven. The seven day program is not about making it safer. The seven day program is about improving the flow through the system, making delayed discharges better. So, we we have it, it traditionally, in my job more difficult to discharge on a Saturday than it was to discharge on a Thursday or a Friday where the family are perfectly happy to have the patient home on a Saturday and that was more difficult because diagnostics weren't available pharmacy wasn't available so we're fixing that element of seven day working mm -hmm. scheduled surgery very very unusual to do scheduled surgery on a Saturday now becoming more usual to do these, day surgery on a Saturday that's these, what the seven day working these are all good things about. just 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 this do you accept that there have been a number of studies, and this is the key thing, a number of studies in the UK and internationally and in Scotland 
all suggesting an issue at weekends. Do you accept that that is the case, and do you believe it applies in Scotland or not? I, I believe that there are a number of studies which suggest mortality is higher at the weekend than during the week. Yes, and I think that may well be true in Scotland. What I don't accept is that's a patient safety problem. I think that's a severity of illness problem. Okay. Okay. So, Dr Keel? Well, I, I was just going to um, say the same. That the evidence, such as it is, is deficient because we don't have the case mix, the severity of illness um, scores of those patients that are coming in at weekend. Like Jason, I think probably there are sick, sicker cohort of patients. But the, the seven-day working, as, as he's already si said, is about trying to speed up the patient journey through hospitals because we know that the longer you stay in hospital, the more you likely are to get a hospital a healthcare acquired infection, for example. Patients don't want to be in there unnecessarily. So the idea about sustainable seven-day services is to improve access to routine diagnostics at weekends, get patients discharged at weekends, rather than waiting till the next week to get those investigations. But I think until we have studies that look at the, the case mix of patients coming in at the weekend compared to those coming in Monday to Friday, we will not know the answer to your question, Mr McIntosh, as to whether there is a problem there. The data indicates more patients are probably dying at the weekend, but it doesn't tell us why. I think Professor Leach said much the same thing, and some of it might be down to sicker patients coming in, as, as you suggest. The number of it is, can you say with certainty that there is no increase in mortality rates at the weekend compared to the week? It's quite the opposite. There is an increase in mortality rates at the weekends than the weekdays. So how can the Cabinet Secretary say with certainty that there's not that problem? Because he's, he's referencing the fact that it's not a patient safety issue. I also no, can no, show no, that I, Tuesdays are... There, there may be higher mortality rates on a Tuesday than a Thursday. There is, there is variation according to case mix. There is no systematic safety problem at weekends compared to weekdays causing excess mortality. So, so the answer that he gave referred only to patient safety. It didn't refer to the rates. We can go and check that. That's fine. Uh, what he actually said was uh, the programme is probably a major contributing factor to why the mortality rate at weekends is no higher than it is during the week. But you just said, Professor Leach, the mortality rate at weekends is higher than it is during so, the week. So, according to the, hand, the, best, the, the best study we have, which is the Handel study, that they found higher mortality rates at the week. More people die at the, uh, on a Saturday and a Sunday. My, my premise is that, that that's not to do with safety, that's to do with case mix. Yeah, but, but that, you know, that wasn't <laughs> what was said, what we're trying to get. You're saying that there is a higher mortality rate at the weekend. The Cabinet Secretary said there's not. That's something that we need to explore further. Um, so I think we'll move on now. Uh, Bruce Crawford. Thank you, Convener. Um, first of all, can I say I appreciate the candid responses we're receiving this morning, thoughtful responses. Um, I was very grateful to Paul Gray for laying out the areas um, from his correspondence he sent us where the key actions and improvements have taken place. Um, I'd like to move on from issues of data or statistics or the stuff that Ken McIntosh was dealing with to get to the core of what we're trying to do, I believe, as a committee. And that's look at a positive way forward in regard to flow, particularly through hospitals. But before I do that, um, Mr McIntosh, um, in his opening statement, made, a, I thought, a rather sweeping statement to say that in recent years, performance in the a &E had deteriorated. Now, from the figures you've certainly provided to us, Mr Gray, in your correspondence, it would seem to me that from 12, uh, 2012 to 2013, certainly the figures we have available here, the weights over four hours have reduced by 19.2% and weights over 12 hours have reduced by 66.4%. Can you confirm I've got these figures right and just give us a general comment on what you believe to be the overall performance in any? &E? So, oh. Over the winter period between November to March 2014, there was a 66% reduction in patients remaining in any &E more than 12 hours. Fewer than 1% of all patients remained longer than 8 hours in A&E. &E. That, that's, that, that's the information I have to hand. Um, the performance uh, in A&E &E was 91.4% 
uh, in the previous year and is now, as I think I said, um, up to 94% indications from a number of boards. Uh, and this is their, their data, not the published data, is that a number of them uh, are meeting and continue to meet the 95% target. Um, as I said in response to the convener, I'm not certain that all will, but the trajectory is in the right direction. Um, we're treating, uh, I think, one and a half million patients a year. Um, and uh, for many, many of these patients, the vast majority, uh, they are getting the treatment uh, within the time we said we would. It is a 95% target. That's because for some people it will not be clinically appropriate to have them out of A&E within four hours. Um, and, uh, you know, that it would, so we're, we're we're, we're discussing here 1% to 2% of patients who are not being seen uh, within, uh, and, and discharged or admitted within the time set. Uh, A&E uh, staff, consultants, trainees, nurses, other professionals, administrators are working very hard under high pressure. And I don't think it's the intention of this committee in any way to undermine that, and indeed at my previous session, the convener was uh, um, quick to uh, assure everyone that, the, that, that it was not the committee's intention to undermine the work being done by NHS staff. So um, I appreciate the point uh, and would want to make it again. Can I, can I just add some uh, um, information for that as well? I think it's quite interesting if we also look at um, where Scotland has, has been in relation to the other home countries um, uh, and indeed further abroad and um, certainly Scotland's performance for some considerable time has been better um, than uh, Northern Ireland and Wales and pretty comparable with England, almost the same. But, and if I take a look at, let's say, median weights, um, Scotland's position in median weights is the best in the UK, um, roughly about 10% better than um, England and considerably better than um, Northern Ireland and Wales. Uh, over, over recent years. Um, and one last thing which um, uh, might be of interest to the committee is uh, a study which has just been published um, by the um, Canadian government which uh, looked internationally at best practice around um, waiting times and particularly at um, accident and emergency. Uh, it was published in June 2014 uh, which highlighted um, Scotland uh, with uh, the, the lines Imagine a land where um, and compared Scotland's performance with the Canadian performance. Uh, and uh, as I say, it uh, shows Scotland in a relatively positive light and is a good read. Thank you. Um, now, quite rightly, Mary Scanlon in earlier evidence is looking at, was looking at the issues of how individuals present themselves, and that's obviously something we need to understand a bit better than you've accepted that. Um, but what, what I would like to try to get on to now is where the best practice has taken place in Scotland from what we saw last week, one of the Certainly one of the areas seems to be Tayside. Um, so the, the question for me is, if Tayside are managing to get to the performance level they are, um, there's obviously a job for the individual boards themselves to do, but there's a, obviously a particular job for the, the centre of the organisation, i.e. government, to make sure that others can achieve the same high um, performance rates. So can you talk me through how... We're going to use the Tayside experience and other good practice to try to get other boards to the same level of outcomes to help the people of Scotland. Well, I'll, I'll give you, uh, I'll ask um, John Conachan and, and Jason Leach to give more, more detail, Mr Crawford, but um, as a for example, uh, Andrew Russell, the medical director of NHS Tayside, has uh, been in NHS Grampian uh, assisting them with developing their processes and protocols, including in accident and emergency. And that's precisely because we believe that there were good lessons that Grampian could learn. I'm giving that as a specific example so that we don't just give you a series of generalised propositions. But uh, Mr Conachan and Professor Leach will be able to give more detail. Um, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd like to say a few words uh, particularly about um, NHS Tayside uh, and then uh, address a couple of things around flow and perhaps uh, yeah. Professor Leach will maybe add to the um, uh, um, update on flow. Um, as a practical example of some of the good practice that we've seen in Tayside, uh, I would pick signposting. 
Um, and that's about making sure that, um, is, you know, this addresses some of the points that Ms Scanlon has raised about um, self-referrals. But uh, TSED have had, operating for some time, uh, a relatively good signposting system. Uh, we took a look at that and issued signposting guidance earlier this year to boards. Um, uh, we agreed that with... Um, so that for the public record, signposting becomes more visible and what it actually means. Yeah. Tell us what signposting is as well, uh, if you don't mind. Signposting is directing the patient to the most appropriate um, point of treatment. Um, whether or not that should be an out-of-hours referral back to GP or indeed treatment inside uh, accident emergency. So signposting is clearly important. It gets the patient mm -hmm. to the right and most appropriate treatment. And, and we took the Tayside experience and uh, we, uh, as I say, issued uh, that Tayside experience in the form of some guidance to uh, NHS boards earlier this year. Uh, we are in the process of view reviewing how that has gone down and it's quite likely in the very near future we will reissue that guidance refreshed by the first six months or nine months of experience of how that rolls out across Scotland. Um, you, you mentioned a very important word earlier and the word was flow. Um, now, I don't want to give you the impression that we've simply just invented a flow programme uh, for Scotland and I'll explain what I mean by flow in a minute fairly recently. Flow, in fact, has been an issue which has been addressed for a considerable number of years. So um, committee members may remember previous reports from Audit Scotland that looked at the level of day case surgery that we were doing. That's one element of promoting better flow because the more we can move out of an inpatient setting into a day case um, setting, it promotes better flow through the hospital resource and inpatient beds. So um, um, in the course of our consideration of the National Lunch Schedule Care and Action Plan last year, we um, uh, established what we call a national flow programme. We're piloting um, new techniques in four boards at the present time. Uh, we, are, we have imported the best international experience that we can from the Institute of Healthcare Optimisation to give us the best international advice on how we should set that up. And we're at a fairly advanced stage, um, uh, particularly in Fourth Valley, in assessing how um, we can promote better flow. Uh, there are three main components to that in the flow programme. First of all, how we can have better utilisation of operating theatres. Um, secondly, how we can smooth the elective programme. Uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Leach referred to the fact that um, when we take a look at electives, which is um, uh, non-emergency inpatient care, there are differences uh, between uh, a Monday, Tuesday and, let's say, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So smoothing that out will give a much better chance for boards to be able to cope with unexpected peaks in demand for unscheduled care. So smoothing electives is important. And then the third element of that is managing some of the natural variation that comes in in terms of unscheduled care. Um, I'll give you an example of the kind of thing that we would want to look at and promote, which is time of day discharge. When we profile um, how hospitals discharge patients, uh, far too many are discharged much later in the day. Uh, if we were able to shift that curve back to having much better discharge rates much earlier in the day, then it would help ease some of the congestion that we sometimes see in some of our hospitals. So those are a couple of practical examples. Uh, I'd like to pass now to Professor Leach on other aspects of flow. So v v very briefly, the, the sharing of best practice across systems of our size is, is a big challenge. It, it's, a, it's a global challenge of how you move what is going well in Lanarkshire, for instance, their hospital at home service, probably the best in the country, and Tayside's signposting system, probably the best in the country. How you share that around everybody. We have a number of ways of doing that. We do it in improvement programmes, using improvement science, the safety programme, the early years collaborative, the person centre care programme. So we have learning systems where we create the opportunity for the practitioners in particular to share that. John has a piece of his organisation called Quest, where they take efficiency and productivity and they apply that same method to efficiency and productivity things and they'll bring people together, they'll share data, they'll share best practice and they'll send people on visits. So Bill Morrison, the A&E consultant from Tayside, is regularly in other A&E departments sharing what they've done in Tayside around that signposting. Lanarkshire, it's a small example, Lanarkshire have started to use public advertising now their nurse director is on the back of a number of buses telling people where is the most appropriate, not actually, she's on a poster, or on the back of the buses telling people where is the most appropriate pe person to engage with, particularly over the winter period. 
And I would commend John's uh, mention of the flow program. The uh, Professor Litvak, who is probably the, the the global expert on hospital flow, has principally worked in the US, and uh, we've engaged his organisation to work first of all with Fort Valley, and we had a, a a day with them, John and I, just at the end of two weeks ago, and uh, they're beginning to do the data crunching of our flow through the Fort Valley Hospital, and then we start to do the work in a fairly, what, what could be a fairly radical redesign of particularly how you do scheduled care and engaging the surgeons around how they might change their weeks. And then we spread to another three boards, and I'm confident, having seen what they've done elsewhere, that, that it will make a significant difference. Plessity is quite mind-boggling, actually, in terms of the scale of what you're having to deal with. But can I just bore down on one particular thing? You talked about Professor Leach, and that's the Lanarkshire Home Service, because one of the questions I wanted to ask was, integrating social care with hospitals and making sure this works better. I'm assuming that's what the Lanarkshire Home Service is doing. So could you tell us a bit more about how that's operating? Because obviously if we were in a position um, to, to improve the delayed discharge issue, and if the Lanarkshire Home Service is helping provide that, then it helps the flow and stops the backlog into the hospitals. So if I'm right, is that is that what that's designed to do? Uh, it's called the asset team. I think most of us have been to visit it. In fact, it, it's, a, it's a shining light of how to do it. It is not the only one in Scotland. And I don't want to give you that impression. Ayrshire and Arden have a very good system. But the Lanarkshire one called the asset team is, is fundamentally moving hospital care into houses. I had a friend who's a carer for his elderly wife who is very frail, has multiple morbidities. And in my old world of, of hospital work, she would have been in hospital, and she would have been in hospital for a long time. She's never in hospital. She is cared for at home. They can do intravenous fluids. They can do antibiotics. They, can, they, they have doctors and nurses who can go out. They do virtual ward rounds each morning in a location where they, where they effectively discuss each of the patients, and then nurses will go out to those people. I, I'm astonished at, at, at how well they can look after sick people in their own homes, in fact. It's a, it's a big, big change. I'm going to perhaps make a mistake and give you a statistic that I can't quite remember, and maybe we should put brackets around it because I'll get you the real one. I think the asset team's most recent data says they've reduced over 75 admissions from 70% to 11%. It's, it's a fairly radical approach to the way we deliver care. And lots of people have been to visit, and lots of people are using it in their... Now, contexts are different. Inverness is different from Motherwell. So, so moving it to Inverness or to the Western Isles will need adjustment. You can't, just, you can't just take it. But people are increasingly using it. I know Lothian have been very interested in, in trying to invest in it. And you're right. It requires the integration of health and social care. The people who visit the houses are not all National Health Service employees. They're social workers. They're care workers. They're, and and the, the badges that they wear become less relevant to, to the family. Last, last question, Kabina. That's helpful in understanding that, but that's actually stopping older people getting into hospital in the first place in, in many ways in the way it's doing it. Currently, we've got older people who are, and, I, and I'm not going to use that term that, that's been used in the past, that is just causing a, a delayed discharge. So can you just give us a general feel about how the integrated social care work that's been going on in the legislation, how you think that will help improve things as we move forward over the next few years, because obviously if we can help there, it's going to help A&E because there will be more beds available to get them in there a bit quicker, if I've got that right. Yeah, no, thank you, Mr Crawford. I think the, I suppose the point is that um, when an elderly person with uh, multiple morbidities goes into hospital, they are probably of a category which then is more likely to become a delayed discharge. So if that lady went in uh, and... Uh, then the difficulties associated with her getting out would be um, would be more profound than in an ordinary case. And therefore, if we can prevent older people from going in in the first place, you're actually reducing the likelihood of them becoming a delayed discharge. On the other end, though, in terms of integration of health and social care, um, what we're doing is bringing together the, the provision by local authorities, the third sector and the health service to ensure that the, 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 the fact that at the moment, for example, people are waiting for care packages, um, that holds them up. What can we do to ensure 
that the, that, that the process for getting a care package is slicker. Is there anything the NHS can contribute to the development of that care package? So it's not just a, well, this is the NHS's job and this is the local authority's job and never the twain shall meet, to bring that conversation together so that the people who are developing the care package understand better from a health uh, service point of view what it is the individual actually needs so that we don't uh, we, we avoid in, in all cases a, if you like a mechanistic assumption that someone can't leave hospital in, until they've got X give a very simple example um, one of the hindrances we saw to someone leaving hospital was because they had to be able um, to go up three steps they lived in a bungalow but there was an, you know, there was there, there, there was a, there was a standardised approach that said until someone could go up three steps, they couldn't go out of hospital. Um, if you asked my mother to go up three steps, she would probably never get out of hospital. Mercifully, she's not in it. But the, the, so there's there's something there about ensuring that the conversations happen to 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 take away any misunderstanding, however well meant, between the various aspects of the care provision. There's also, I know this is a discussion about, about accident and emergency, but there is a 75% correlation between delayed discharge and increased pressure in accident and emergency. And there is also, in Scotland, in many pockets, a, a, a straightforward lack of care home places. Um, now, one of the discussions, therefore, that has to happen between the NHS and the uh, local authorities, and I say it has to happen, it is happening, um, is what can we do to provide more step-down facilities? How can we ensure that um, the, 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 there is uh, a sufficiency of care home places? You'll be aware that um, Glasgow City Council wasn't able to let a contract for care, home, uh, for care homes because um, of the, uh, the economic conditions and the, the differential in what Glasgow City Council thought they were prepared to pay and what the market wanted. So there are, there are, you know, there are a number of issues around this, which, um, to a degree, the integrated joint boards and the chief officers of these boards will be working with um, the health service and local authorities to seek to address. But there are also some market conditions, uh, and I don't, you know, so I don't want to leave that point out of what I say. Yeah, I'm a, I recall, and I'm sure the convener will as well, from time as being a council leader, actually, sometimes when councils re withdraw themselves from the market in, that, in, that, in these circumstances, it then leaves the private sector with a market to, to deal with in its own way, and sometimes you need a bit of regulation in there. But, convener, I've taken a fair bit of time, but thank you for your perseverance and thank you for the officials for answering. Can I just stick with that issue about what we can do to, to improve things? Um, I referred earlier on to Dr Martin McKechnie and he said that there was no problem recruiting young doctors to the first years of emergency medicine training in Scotland, but they were not completing the course to become senior doctors or consultants. Last week we heard from Mr Takor um, from Tayside that he had a concern that medical students were being asked to specialise very early, even, and I think I think he said that sometimes it was even before they had completed their courses and that that was prejudicial to moving in not just the accident emergency but to the way that they were, they were doing training. Is that something that you're looking at? Well, we're certainly keen to uh, ensure that such flexibilities as can be made available are made available. And I, I, I did uh, see the point to which you refer, Convener, and uh, Dr Kay will be able to say a bit more about that. Well, the, the current uh, trainee doctor recruitment system is something called Modernising Medical Careers, which came in about 2006 7 And the aim of that was to better match the number of trainees to the number of expected consultant jobs at the end of their, their training. And what happened was that, that doctors were recruited to what was called run-through training, so they were set on a career specialty course very early on in their career after they'd done their house jobs, you know. Um, the, the main aim of that, as I say, was to try and better match the numbers of doctors that we were training to the number of avail available consultant or G peoples and to try and shorten the length of time it took to train a specialist. In actual fact, the average length of specialty training is still somewhere between eight and nine years. So it's not that much shorter. 
We're now moving, some of you may be aware of the Greenaway Review, which was published a few months ago, which is looking at the shape of medical postgraduate training, recognising the new world that we're all inhabiting. And a lot of what we've been talking about today is uh, set in the context of an ageing population, more people having more than one health condition, multimorbidities, and a question, have we got the medical workforce that's best able to deal with that new population of patients? And I think the conclusion probably is that we don't at the moment, and we need to roll back a bit from where we've gone in terms of sub-specialisation to producing more generalist doctors who are better able to cope with the whole patient and deal with more of their multi-morbidities. So we're in a kind of transition period because we're, we're beginning to explore how we might implement Greenaway across the UK. And this would offer benefits not just to the NHS in terms of providing a more flexible medical workforce, but I think also benefits to the trainee doctors in that they would be recruited to broad-based training schemes with sort of groups of conditions like women and children's health. The, the, the training will bridge primary and secondary care and there will be more opportunities for them to opt out of one particular course of training if they think that that's not going to suit them. So more flexibility for the NHS in terms of the workforce that we're producing, more flexibility for the doctor. They're not locked into a specialist route. So we're at a stage where we have a UK steering group, which it so happens is chaired by somebody from Scottish government. Um, a number of stakeholder events have been held across the UK. So we're going to gather the, the views from those and then um, make a decision about how Greenaway should be implemented in Scotland. Now, that's not going to happen overnight, obviously, but the aim is a better, more flexible, more generalist trained medical workforce. Uh, Willie Coffey. Thank very much, convener. Um, I, I think the, the message earlier from uh, Bruce Crawford there was to recognise that performance within a &E has significantly improved uh, over the years rather than deteriorated. I mean, and I'm, I'm less concerned, I would say, whether we or whether we don't hit this 95 figure, because only a number of years ago it was 84, and that was hailed as a fantastic performance. So statistics can tell you different things, and we can use them in different ways and so on. As a member of this audit committee, I'm more concerned to hear from you that there are systems and processes in play to continually Im improve and to address the issues that arise from time to time, and, I'm, and I am encouraged about a lot of the things that I've heard during this meeting and previous <coughs> previous meetings, uh, particularly from the Tayside representatives that came the other week, and again, Bruce Crawford raised their issue. They, they, they talked about um, signposting and, and trying to deal with uh, patients as they arrive and sending them to the appropriate care route for them, and I would sincerely hope that those kinds of lessons are being learned and shared throughout the rest of the board. So, I mean, are you able to say with any kind of conf confidence that will we, will we get to this 95 and do we, do we have to? Because I think, Mr Gray, you said that some patients might, it might not be appropriate for them to be pulled out of the system within four hours. You mentioned that, I think, in your presentation, and I was quite struck by that. So, as health professionals yourself, we're, we're politicians and we'll react to the, the, the 95 figure when you release it or whether you don't. But could we hear from you just what your, your view is as health professionals about that kind of aspect? Are we going in the right direction? Are we improving the service? And uh, will, we, will we reach the 95? And do you think we really have to achieve that? Well, Mr Coffey, first of all, I should say that the health professionals with me today are, are Dr Keelan, Professor uh, Leach. I have other professionals from other disciplines too. Um, but uh, So I will ask them to comment. My view, and this is my view, Mr Coffey, is that when, when we say that we're going to do something, we should make a determined effort to do so. 
a, sta a target is set to be challenging. It's not set just to be simple. I mean, I could just say, well, I think we should do 90% and then we'd be doing it all the time. And, and that doesn't seem to me to be realistic. I think in terms of public confidence, when we say we should do something, when we say we're going to do something, we should. I spoke to um, the lead A&E consultant in Borders General Hospital about whether he thought that you know, it was 95% the right number. Now, we could argue whether 94 or 96 is the right number, but certainly, in, in his view, 95% um, gave a sufficiency of uh, what I would call um, impetus to the system to ensure that people were not left in A&E beyond the point at which it was clinically appropriate for them to be there. He was equally clear that there are, in a number of complex and difficult cases, there are no benefits whatsoever and some disadvantages to taking patients out of A&E if that's the best place for them to, to receive care. So having a 100% target would be plain wrong because it would disadvantage patients. It would mean that they got less good outcomes. Um, as I say, one could argue up and down on a few percentage points, but for my part, we have committed as a National Health Service to, to working towards this target. I think it's important for public confidence that we do so, but I do think we should never, at any point, allow a target to cut across a, a safe clinical judgment. But perhaps Dr. Keel and Professor Leach would want to add to that. Well, I, I, I agree with your, your question. You know, you, we, we need to constantly be asking, is it worth driving that extra percentage? But as, as Mr. Gray has said, um, it's clear from emergency medicine consultants that they think the four-hour target is a good one with that 5% flexibility for those that, that need to be in a &E for longer. I mean, it, within my professional life, you know, going back many decades, um, no. I can remember <laughs> patients languishing in A&E &E for well over 12 hours. You know, they were there the next day when you went back down into the department. So the amount of improvement that's been achieved by NHS Scotland staff is quite incredible, if you look back even just a few years. So I think the performance is great. It's clear that the consultants, the medical profession, want the target to remain. They don't like all of the targets that we've got, but they like this one. So I think we need to stick with it. So, so I, I agree we should strive for the 95%, but I also take the premise of your question that 94, 93, 96, is that really making a huge amount of difference? I, I think the the use of a target to make simplistic judgments of the quality of services is, is not the right thing to do. I think it's one element and one lever that we have in order to improve the quality of the service we deliver to the population. So, so I, I think we should keep it. But I think underneath that, the fact that we treat and discharge or admit half of the patients within two hours probably says something about the quality of the service we're delivering equally as the 95% the in tells us. So, so I, I think it's part of a package of things around quality improvement methods, around scrutiny, around the delivery of that quality service that we should make judgment for. And just to emphasise Mr Gray's point, that at, at no time should the target supersede clinical judgment. So if somebody should stay because they should wait for a surgeon, then they should stay and wait for the surgeon. So that at no time should the target be, be used in any way to undermine patient safety, and I'm, I'm confident that doesn't happen. Well, you'll, you'll never hear end at the audit committee taking a view like that, but failure to meet targets, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, but there was a good example uh, raised during the discussion with previous colleagues, and it was this issue about people being discharged at weekends, then a, then a queue building up on admissions on Mondays and Tuesdays, and it, it seemed quite an obvious area to, to, to win and to help push the target up, if that's, if that's what we all collectively want to achieve. Is that widespread across the NHS where it's people are s discharged more slowly at the weekend and then we get a glut of people arriving on Mondays and Tuesdays because they've waited all weekend to present? So what can we do about something like that and how can we smooth that across the, all the boards and, and actually push your target up even further? Uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, th I think you make a very good point there. Um, uh, I think I addressed that in part when I was talking earlier about the Flow Project. Um, because one of the things that's at the heart of the full project is how we can better balance out the other half of the work, 
uh, which is the um, elective work, which is the planned work that comes in and which has got, um, certainly from uh, our experience, um, uh, a waiting towards that work being com being done and started at the um, at the beginning of the week. Mondays and Tuesdays are very popular operating days for surgeons. Um, Thursdays and Fridays are perhaps less popular. So, uh, one of the things that which is at the heart of the seven day project is considering how we can utilise the entire resource of the NHS over that seven days. And as I said earlier, um, smoothing out uh, those peaks and troughs. So, so you're you're right that discharging at weekends and discharging earlier in the day. Is a, is is a help to that flow. Discharge. It sounds simple. Just discharge the patient. These patients are often frail elderly. They often need adjustments at home. They often don't come with ready-made carers mm. that just happen to be in their family, and they require extensive drugs on discharge. Not and the bag of drugs is only one element of that discharge process. They require very clear instruction. They require education about what's going to happen to those drugs now. And so it's not always as simplistic as a, a process as perhaps we're led to believe that just push them out at three o'clock on a Saturday and all will be well. So the seven day project is about making that better in conjunction with social care colleagues, in conjunction with those who do put in the little doors in your shower so you can be at home with the door in your shower. It's, it's not... It's not just scheduled healthy people having surgery who we need to get out on a Saturday and a Sunday. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, my last point is just to pick up on that debate about um, morbidity at weekends. I was absolutely fascinated with the exchange between Ken McIntosh and yourself, Professor Leachman. If you look at any statistics about anything, you can pick a story, can't you? You could, you could pick um, when, do, when are people more likely to be, say, killed in a car accident. And there's probably a time that it's more likely. And there's probably a day that it's more likely. But the question, as I understood it from you, is is that a question of some kind of neglect in the system or lack of resource or lack of management or something that doesn't happen at that particular day? Or is it just a characteristic of the population and general behaviour as it, as it presents itself? And I took it from, from your explanation that it was probably the latter because we're uncertain about, about, about the, the reality and the facts of that. So, I mean, pe human beings are... are People are people. We, we don't always act in a uniform and consistent way, and our behaviours will be, be variable. So until and unless you can have some kind of data, that, some kind of analysis, some kind of research that, that can pinpoint any particular causes, then really we're, we're no further forward. But in my criticising my own position, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not remotely complacent about safety in Scotland's hospitals, and I, I don't think anybody could ever accuse me of being so. If, if anybody... Has, has been focused on the safety of our hospital care, then I, I would suggest it's, it's me in our, in our leadership of the safety programme. So I, I, do, uh, I do care about the data and I do care about making it better. And if I, have, if I see things in the data or in narrative or in story that suggest something different, I, I will be the first to try and implement change that would, that, that would make that appropriate. You haven't seen that yet. Correct. Thank you. Colin Cale. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, could I just go back a question or two to Dr. Keel? Uh, it was the information you were giving about the, uh, the, the um, difficulties in uh, people going through training and all the rest of it. Is there, is there some information or, or tracking of where um, the destinations, if you like, of where these people who have gone through the training actually end up? Um, you know, because, you know, you, you hear all, all sorts of stories from uh, about um, people going through training who have set their mind on having a, a a future in research, for instance, and stuff like that. And how how can you actually um, encourage um, the popular subjects, if you like, to be uh, followed through after training, as against what you're really looking for is to fill the vacancies locally? Well. Um NHS Education for Scotland are beginning to try and do that kind of tracking. It, it hasn't been commonly done, but um, it's, it's, it's now becoming more feasible. I, th I think in terms of A&E, if we stick to people training in, in emergency medicine, it's clear from the trainee fill rates, the number of trainee posts that are being filled, that this is a, a specialty that, that is in difficulty. 
And I think that's multifactorial. Um, people in that specialty work extremely hard, consultants and trainees. And uh, it could be that younger doctors now are not so keen in the sort of lifestyle choices that have to be made to follow through in an, an emergency medicine career. They're working under enormous pressure at the front door of the hospital. And you can't do that for a career that's going to last 30, 40 years. I think we have to increasingly recognise as people go through their career as consultants, that's what I'm talking about now, um, that, that we have to acknowledge they can't be doing the sharp end front door stuff as they did when they were in their late 20s, early 30s. Um, but it's difficult to adjust a system um, to accommodate that, that uh, you know, to take that into account. So I think, I think young doctors in entering training are looking at issues such as lifestyle choice. We know, for example, that some of them are choosing to emigrate to Australia or New Zealand, not in vast numbers, but we, we know that, that you know, there are significant numbers. And that, again, is about lifestyle. It's not all about the climate. It's about the way work patterns are in those countries. So we're paying attention to all of that. And um, we know in terms of retaining people to work in Scotland, um, if you train in Scotland and you have a good training experience in whatever specialty it is, then you're more likely to want to train in, to stay in the country. So I think role models in terms of the medical workforce are incredibly important to junior doctors. If you end up working with a con consultant who's enthusiastic about how their career has panned out, is enthusiastic about the work they're doing, then you're much more likely to be enthused too and to stick with it. If you unfortunately end up with some who are a bit more burned out, maybe a bit more cynical, then you're going to pick up on that and maybe not stick with the training. So I think it's incredibly important and part of the CMO's role to make sure that the medical leadership is there to demonstrate to trainees that what they're doing is worthwhile, it's a rewarding career, and they should stick with it. It's not unusual to Scotland. It would be everywhere. Indeed, in emergency medicine, there are vacancy rates across the whole of the UK. It's a difficult to fill specialty. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. OK, thank you very much, and thank you to all our witnesses for their their contribution. It's you know clearly a, a very challenging area and there's no doubt in the, the commitment um, of, our, of our witnesses to see improvement. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to have a suspend the meeting, have a short break uh, and then we'll get our next set of witnesses in. So thank you.
reconvene the meeting. Um, item 3 on the agenda, um, Section 22 report, the 2013-14 audit of the Scottish Government Consolidated Accounts. And um, I will invite evidence from the Auditor General on the audit of the Scottish Government uh, Consolidated Accounts Common Agricultural Policies Futures Programme. We have with us the Auditor General, Carolyn Gardner, uh, Mark Taylor, the Assistant Director, and Gemma Diamond, the Senior Manager of Audit Scotland. If we could invite the Auditor General to make a contribution. Thank you, Convener. I'm bringing you a report to the Committee today on an issue arising from the audit of the Scottish Government Consolidated Accounts. The report is about the Common Agricultural Policy Futures Programme, the CAP Futures Programme. The Futures Programme is a five-year business change process, which is currently expected to cost £137.3 million to deliver CAP reform in Scotland. There are two main elements to the programme. Firstly, to redesign working practices to focus on the customer and generate efficiencies. And secondly, to develop a new IT system to, to deliver the new CAP and improved ways of working. This is a very significant programme for the government. Each year, the government distributes approximately £700 million of European funding through the CAP to Scottish farmers and to rural businesses. And any failure to meet the new EC regulations could lead to significant costs for the Scottish government. The purpose of my report is to highlight the significant risks the programme is carrying. The government recognises this risk in the governance statement included in its 2013-14 accounts. And my report is based on a high-level review of progress in the first 18 months of the programme. We are undertaking more detailed work and will report on this as the programme reaches its critical milestones over the months ahead. Overall, report, my report highlights that the programme has so far proved significantly more complex and more challenging than the government anticipated. The programme team has recognised this. They have recognised the significant risks to the programme, which arise from the potential late delivery of milestones and also from increasing costs. The business case for the programme was approved in December 2012. At that stage, detailed information on the EC requirements wasn't known. The programme has experienced continuing difficulty since then, and total forecast costs have increased from £88 million to £137 million as the team has had more detail on the EC requirements and the IT needed to deliver this. It's important to note that the programme is working to fixed regulatory timescales, and within the next three months the team will have to make critical decisions about whether the new IT system will be ready to manage the payments application process or whether they need to implement contingency plans. In a bid to meet these timescales, the programme team have had to scale back some of the original scope of the business case. This includes changing the plans for the IT component to map registered land, and also removing some of the wider business change elements that were originally included. Management acknowledge these difficulties and are taking action. The last independent assurance review in May 2014 concluded that significant changes to the programme were required immediately if successful delivery was to be achieved, and as a result the programme board established a corrective action plan. There's evidence of progress against that action plan, but it's too early to see if these actions will increase the confidence in successful delivery by the milestones required. I've concluded that the Futures Programme will carry significant risk right up until implementation and beyond. The purpose of my report is to bring this to the Parliament's attention, uh, together with the ongoing risks of achieving successful delivery of the programme and overall value for money. As always, convener, my colleagues and I are happy to answer questions from the committee. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I was actually very surprised at uh, how interesting the Scottish Government's consolidated accounts into the Common Agricultural Policy was. I actually thought it was just a paper we would note, but uh, the more I read, the more, concern, uh, more concerned I became. So I just have uh, very brief uh, questions, if I may, Convener. And the first one is from paragraph 5. And it states the Scottish Government has estimated it could incur costs of up to £50 million a year if the IT system failed to deliver cap reform. £50 million is a lot of money. Uh, is that, well, it's obviously a possibility, and where would it come from? My second question relates to paragraph 8 to 10. You've already said that the original business case was £88 million and it's now £137 million. 
I would like to ask who the IT partner is. And uh, I think my next question goes on to exhibit two on page seven. And that is really, will the farmers be paid? Uh, the risks arising from this December 2015 reputational risk as customers previously been paid in December uh, and it may affect this timetable and for uh, June 2016 ECN deadline for making payments a regulatory risk with financial penalty penalties arising from non-compliance. So it's the 50 million that the government is incurring, which seems to me some sort of fine for not achieving uh, deadlines. Uh, secondly, the huge increase from 88 to 137 million for the uh, IT system. Thirdly, the uncertainty to farmers. Will they be paid when th they will be paid? I have no doubt. But will they be paid when they expect to be paid and they need that money to purchase uh, grain for the, the following year? And will there be future fines for the government June 2016, this financial uh, penalties? So those are my three questions. Thank you, Ms Scanlon. Um, first of all, I'm delighted that um, you're finding the consolidated accounts interesting. We think they're fascinating and it's part of our mission is to, to convince all of you that that's the case. <laughs> Sad, <laughs> really, but thank you. Um, I'll, I'll start on the value for money questions, the costs, um, and bring colleagues in and we'll then perhaps move on to the IT system and the impact on farmers and rural businesses. Um, first of all, we think the, the financial risks, the value for money risks here are, fall into three categories. The first is that the cost of the system is clearly already significantly higher than was originally envisaged. Um, from the original estimate of 88 million to the current estimate of 137 million and the possibility that that may increase further. Linked to that, we know already that the scope of the system and the programme will be more limited than originally planned, um, with some important elements being taken out of the current phase, and if they are to be developed, uh, the need for that to be part of a future business plan and future costs associated with that. The third cost, um, as you've uh, suggested, relates to the possibility, and it is only a possibility at this stage, that if the uh, programme can't deliver the EC requirements, there may be financial consequences or penalties for the Scottish Government directly. Um, and I'll ask Mark at that point just to pick up the question of the 50 million, if I may. Mercy as well, that was my answer. I'll, I'll pick that up before I Sorry. bring Mark in, because it's, it's clearly you. key. Um, at the moment, I think it's fair to say that the government is absolutely focused on making sure that payments can be made to farmers. This is a vital part of Scotland's economy. Uh, for parts of Scotland, it's a huge part of the economy overall, and there's a lot of attention going into that. There is still a risk there, but I think it's the focus of efforts. The, uh, the other risk, though, is that those payments are made without all of the EC requirements in terms of controls being met and the possibility there may be fines coming from that. But we can perhaps expand on that as, as the answer develops. Mark, do you want to pick up the 50 million question? Yes, uh, thank you, Officer General. The, uh, the question of the 50 million, that's the Scottish Government's estimate as, as to what might be at stake from the system that the European Commission has, essentially to police the way in which Scottish Government makes sure it, it pays the right amounts to the right people at the right time. And uh, the European Commission and uh, long-standing members might have a, a memory of, of this issue coming before the committee previously, but the, uh, the, the European Commission has the power effectively to withhold funding where it feels that the control systems, the checks that are required to make sure that the right people are getting the right amount of money aren't as robust as it feels they should be. And there are certain uh, requirements that are laid down and specified for how those systems should work. What the government recognises is if it develops a system to, de to uh, uh, deliver the new CAP programme and some of those uh, 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 checks aren't built into the system, those perhaps aren't, aren't operated as robustly as they might be, uh, 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 and the European Commission ultimately uh, comes along and identifies that, the 50 million is their assessment of what might be a sta at stake in those circumstances, and that's one of the numbers that is factored into the business case for this. The, the government's clear that, uh, that it needs to have uh, 
improve systems to make sure that the system that it operates is as robust as it can be to mitigate, to prevent the risk of that 50 million being at stake later. I think we think there's a lot of work still to, to do. Government recognises that to get such robust systems in and uh, that, 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 that's why uh, £50 million is uh, stated in the report and very much features in the Scottish Government's own business case for the need for this system. Thank you. It's actually more concerning. And I'll just leave it there. But the fact that the system is more limited, and you do say in paragraph 15, this investment will not provide all the functionality originally planned. So we don't have the new system we wanted. We've got a bit of an updated system that we've already got to try and make it work. By the way, you haven't mentioned who the uh, IT provider is. Jim will pick up that part of the oh, question. Okay. And, and the second one, I, I mentioned the 50 million, and I also, also mentioned the, the risks to farmers and the risks to the government for not making the deadline. Uh, the 50 million is sort of allocated for not being able to uh, achieve deadlines at the moment. Could there be an additional penalty, you said, uh, the EC could withhold funding if the systems are still not in place. Could it be more than 50 million? I think the short answer to that one is that yes, it could be more than 50 million. I think to be clear on the 50 million, this isn't an amount that's been budgeted for and allocated. I think this is an amount that in assessing the business case that if the systems weren't ultimately as robust as they would need to be, yeah. then that might be the amount that would be payable and would need to be budgeted and allocated and that in the future. 50 million would come out of the agricultural business uh, budget, so it would come from elsewhere within the budget. Yeah, so, so to be clear on that, what would have to, the Scottish Government would have to find the money from somewhere and manage it across its budget as a whole. And, and, and They'd have to find it yeah. from within the budget for agriculture at, or the budget as a whole? At the budget as a whole. As a whole, yeah. I'll ask Gemma to pick up a question about thank, the IT provider. Thank you. Um, the Scottish Government has contracted with um, CGI as its IT delivery partner, previously known as Logica. CGI. Previously known as who? Logica. Okay. I'll just leave yeah, it there. Thank you, Bruce Crawford. Thank you, Vera. Can I just first of all check that we're dealing with like for like figures? The 88 million and the 137 million. Are these like for like figures? Um, not exactly, but. Um, mainly because of reductions that have been made to the scope of the project. When the business case was originally put together in 2012, the overall estimated cost at that stage was £88 million. Um, that's been revised upwards over the period since then and is now the current estimated cost is £137.3 million. But that £137.3 million is forecast to buy a more limited IT system than the one that was planned at, at the start of the process. I get that bit. It was more to do with whether VAT was applicable to both figures. Gemma, to talk you through that, to make sure that we don't mislead you on it. There's a, there are some um, factors about the treatment of VAT and contingency. Yeah, I that's think, that are what important. I want to make sure we're yes. dealing with like yeah. for like. Yeah. yeah, there are difficulties in comparing the business case figures and the, and the um, spend to date because of how some factors have been implied, including inflation. So I'll just take you through it. So in the original business case, the cost was estimated at 88 million, and that was without any VAT or inflation applied to that. That was not included in the original business case. Um, the most recent business case, um, which was in March 2014, estimated the cost at 111 million, and that is directly comparable to the 88 million. If you then add VAT and inflation to the 111 million, that converts 111 million to 127.8 million. And we can then take, so that's the, the full cost essentially in the revised business case. And when you can compare that 127.8 million to the 137.3 million, which is the current forecast for spend. So let's take this back to the very beginning then. The 88 million, if you apply VAT, and inflation, what would that figure give us? That wasn't calculated in the original business case, and we haven't, because of the, um, the we couldn't compare the two, we've t t essentially taken the steps to be able to take you from what was the 88 million to what is the current spend today, but we haven't converted that um, original cost in the business case as the Scottish Government didn't apply inflation factors at that time, VAT. Okay, C can you give us these figures? Because really, we need to see be able to compare one with the other to get the real level of uplift? Is it possible to, 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 to obtain that? 
We can give you our estimate of it and yeah, provide it separately. Um, yeah, Gemma's helpful. point is that it wasn't included in the I, original. I, I understand case. that, and, yeah. and it probably should have been. But, yeah. but so to enable this committee to be able to look at the real starting figure yeah. and the real potential end figure yeah. would be useful. Um, in regard to the elements of this £50 million fine, which is obviously a concern if it was to become a reality, would you consider it to be an advantage that the government have removed some elements that were originally part of the functionality and are prepared to spend a bit more money to get to where they need to be, even although the estimates are higher than they should have been in the beginning. Is that an advantage to avoid being in a situation to pay £50 million fine? We certainly welcome the fact that the government recognises the significant risks that are associated with delivering this programme, which is key to the rural economy, farmers and, and rural businesses, um, and the fact that as problems have become apparent, a lot of effort has gone into um, forecasting what the impact of that might be in terms of the government's budget and the effects on farmers and, and rural businesses and looking at what the options are for responding to that. Um, so there are two elements to that response. One is contingency plans for dealing with applications from farmers when they come in if the system is not able to do it at that stage. And the second is looking at how the, the system itself can be reduced in scale to make it more possible to deliver what's required. That planning is a good thing. Having said that, I think we would all, all rather not be in the position where it's needed, given the importance of this investment for such a major um, programme with a big impact on large parts of the economy. Okay. Convener, I'm very grateful to the report because it does highlight the risks quite clearly. But I think Scotland's farmers, as Mary's identified how important they are, will realise the complexity of CAP and the scale of challenge to get this right. And what do I mean by that? In May, June, we became aware, I'm not sure the exact date, it was May or June this year, we became aware of what the common agricultural policy regime would look like. And it takes into account a myriad of aspects. And I just wrote down a few last night that I know of. Modulation between Pillar 1 and 2, convergence uplift payments, measures to deal with slipper farmers, regionalisation, specific provisions for islands, specific provisions for new entrants, measures around greening and ecological focus, voluntary couple support for the beef sector and voluntary couple support for the sheep sector. A hugely complicated system that's being asked to design and cope with all of these elements. Is that some of the reasons why do you think in these circumstances the government have had a challenge on their hands to make sure they have an IT system that's fit for purpose, given how late in the day they knew about what the actual elements would be. There's no doubt that the complexity of the new CAP scheme and the um, late point at which some of the details became available to governments across Europe has made this more complex. One of the reasons, though, why I thought it was right to report to this committee at this stage is because some of the underlying um, factors in the delivery of the programme are consistent with what we've reported in the past about large IT developments in the public sector. Um, so we have seen continuing problems in getting the right capacity and capability of staff able to do this. Um, we've seen some problems with the programme management um, from the outset of the business case and the development. And we've seen changing governance arrangements which have not made it easier to deliver something which was never going to be a straightforward project. Um, both of those things are true. It is complex, and we think there were shortcomings in the management of the project, which are common to a number of other public sector IT developments. Give me just one last point. In that wider European perspective, I'm aware that the European Court of Auditors' opinion, because I just did a bit of a Google search on it, um, produced a report on the 8th of March and that Court of Auditors at that time said they expressed they had doubts about whether the measures proposed in the CAP could be implemented effectively without imposing excessive administrative burden on managing agencies and farmers. They also said, as far as the CAP reform was concerned, the limited specification additional administration burdens introduced will have an effect on the costs of the reform, which the Commission estimates are likely to represent an increase of 15% overall, Member states consider that the percentage increase in costs may be even bigger. So this is just an, isn't just a Scottish problem, according to the European Court of Auditors. It's a European problem. Would you share that view? 
I've said that it's clear this is a complex scheme to administer and um, some members here will be aware that we will be required to, required to do more as auditors to verify the payments being made in Scotland. So the administrative costs and complexity are higher. There's no question about that. The question about whether that investment is justified for the benefits of the scheme is one that I'm not um, equipped to answer at the moment. Mark's our expert on European agriculture funding and liaises with auditors across the other UK governments um, about progress that's being made and the challenges being seen and may, may want to amplify what I've just said about that. Thank you, Auditor General. I think, I think it's fair to say that the challenges that Scottish Government are facing at the most basic level to put in a new system against the tight timetable, fixed regularity, uh, fixed deadlines and uh, the complexity that you've outlined are shared across Europe, of course they are and different organisations are at different stages, different countries are at different stages of responding to that. I think historically within the UK there's been issues with other paying agencies across the UK, other parts of the UK who have uh, uh, had difficulties in implementing their systems and those are well documented in the rest of the UK and I think, I think that each of the component parts of the UK are facing those sort of problems at the moment. I think as the Auditor General said, we are keen to highlight the risk around this particular project to the committee, but also to, to against that context, to highlight that in the way in which the programme has been managed, and we don't underestimate the challenge that's here, there are some common themes coming about some of the difficulties that Scottish Government themselves have recognised. And, and to be clear, we understand they've uh, they, they, they're, they're aiming to address these, but there's underlying issues, as Governor General said, about uh, capability and capacity and uh, the, uh, detailed planning around uh, around what is a very difficult plan to put together. But I think there's been some frustration internally that uh, within the government that it's taken them uh, the period it has to get more specific, more detailed plans in place. And I think they recognise those issues and we think they're they're aiming to do something about it. But there is that underlying risk there and that's what we're keen to share with the committee today. Yeah, thanks, Convener. It was obvious from the 2000, I think it was 2005 cap reform, the, the huge difficulties that experienced in England in terms of bringing in the new system there. Um, and, and obviously that caused them huge problems. I hope that we, we, can, we don't get to that level of difficulty here. Okay, thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, um, So just to pull on some of the cost issues and so on here. The original business case was in December 2012. Um, comments made several times about the uh, delays in clarification of the, regu of the regulations. Would it be reasonable to say that uh, these clarifications were what drove the review in March 2014 of the business case, and was that done reasonably timelessly? Jim, are you able to pick that up? Um, I think it was part of the reason why they revised the business case. Um, Essentially, the programme team were further through the project and had a few more uh, um, known information, so they had more known and more information on costs and more detail. They'd also been working with their IT delivery partner on what the scope of the IT um, would look like um, and what the requ actual requirements of the IT were. And obviously that is very much linked to what the requirements, uh, the EC requirements um, were. So it was essentially, I think that was part of the reason why um, it was revised at that time. Um, the programme team keep the business case as a live document, so there are um, minor revisions um, quite regularly, but this was a major update that they did to the business case in March 14. I mean, almost the entire increase in the, the overall business uh, case is caused by IT, and one can be very cynical about IT costs because they all seem to work out a, a multiple of what you expect. But would it be reasonable to say that uh, the, the virtual doubling of the IT costs relates directly to, quite simply, the new, the new regulations coming in, the compliance around that, and the realisation of the complexity of that and the additional costs coming from that? I don't think it is fair to say that, but again, I will ask Gemma to amplify for you her experience of working on this closely. Um, I think, again, it, it is part of the issue. Um, I think that when um, the programme team started working with the IT delivery partner, there, there was a long time spent looking at what the requirements would be um, for the IT. Um, certainly, we've, the work we've done so far is only a high level review. Um, as your general mentioned, we are going to be continuing to look at this um, and to look at um, what have been the most significant um, 
um, significant um, problems with the programme encountered to date. But what we can say is that I think it is part of the problem um, in looking at the EC requirements, but that they also were looking internally at what else they wanted to achieve because the programme was not just about the IT. It was also to deliver um, business change and change in the um, working practices. So that involved working internally to be clear about actually what did that mean in practice and what would that look like. But uh, having said that, the increase in the, the cost of the business case is almost entirely IT related and not to, you know, the other part of the project. Would that would that be well? It, it is correct because that's what you say here. It, it is IT related. I think the point we're we're trying to convey is that that doesn't only relate to the EC requirements. Um, so, for example, one of the things the government wanted to achieve was having mobile technology that field officers could use to go out in verifying land parcels and the features of the the um, businesses that were attracting grant. That was intended to generate efficiencies in the government's running costs as well as satisfying what the EC required. Um, so the EC requirements were part of it, but so were the requirements for ways of working more generally in the government's administration of this, and both of those affected the IT costs. And those uh, upgrades were in the original business case and the original IT cost? That's right, and they're not in the £137 million forecast cost at this stage. They're things which have come out of the scope to try and both contain costs and increase the uh, probability of delivering a successful system on time. So again, coming back, the, the changes to the EU EC regulations must have been really quite startling because you've got an IT budget that's doubled and you've taken a lot of key elements out of it in order to keep it moving forward. So there must have been quite horrific changes. There's, there's a number of things going on in there. The first is that the EC, the scheme itself is different. So, so the, the basis on which money is paid is a different scheme from the previous CAP scheme. The EC's um, requirements in terms of controls and checks and validation to ensure that money is properly paid are more rigorous than they have been in the past. And the government was hoping to get um, efficiencies in ways of working from investing in the new programme through things like mobile technology and allowing landowners to update um, the records of land parcels online themselves. All three of those were things that were driving the IT requirements. Um, the EC requirements themselves are only one part of that. They are important, but they're not, they're not all of the shift in the IT costs. When did the IT partner come on board? Jenna, can you confirm that? Um, the IT delivery partner was appointed in March 2013. So they, they weren't part of the original programme that was agreed in December 2012. Did they participate in that? The business case um, that was approved in um, December 2012 had an options appraisal in it about how they would contract with um, an external contractor to deliver um, the IT system. Um, the option that was chosen within that business case was to appoint an IT delivery partner and subsequent to that approval they went through the tender process to appoint the external contractor in March 2013. So when the external contractor came board in March 2013, they must have at that point accepted the, the costings, the budget that was available. The original um, <coughs> business case um, had a cost in it, a forecast cost of 88 million. Um, the um, tender documentation that went out for the IT delivery partner had a forecast, wasn't a fixed contract that was signed because they knew that they would need to go through the rec a scoping phase with the IT delivery partner as to what to, was going to be delivered. Um, the forecast cost for the um, delivery partner was 20 million at that stage. Presumably we now have a a contract in place that's got a figure around it? The contract is still the same contract that was signed at that time. It's not a fixed price contract. It's not a fixed price contract? No. Then how is the pricing determined? The pricing is determined through um, discussion with a supplier. So each component part is priced and that price is agreed by the government and the IT supplier as part of the contract. It's, it's not just an open-ended contract. 
the um, they are, the Scottish Government and the supplier are using quite an incremental approach to approach to delivering the IT, which means that they are not doing it in big stages, but they're trying little bits at a time and costing it along with that process. So it's, it's quite a different way of approaching it than has the government yeah. has been used to in the past. But you're comfortable the controls around it are adequate and robust? Within the terms of the contract, the controls are adequate and robust. But as is the case with many large IT developments, it's practically impossible to let a contract which is fixed price at the outside at the outset and costs increase as the work develops, um, the scope becomes clearer and the programme management um, improves. So there is a risk cost could increase further, as we've said in our report. The way it's being managed at this stage we have no cause to be concerned about, but there are significant risks to cost as well as delivery, as we've said in this report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Will the coffee and then come back to us? Very much, convener. I mean, this it sounds very much to me like um, a kind of requirement specification issue again, rather than a specific IT issue. It's not about failing computers or software. It's it's a bit it's akin to being asked to to build a house before you get the drawings, and then as you get the drawings, you discover you're being asked to build a set of flats. That's a, that's quite a common issue throughout the whole history of the IT projects that I was working in over the course of my professional career and, it, and it's what happens when your customer, in this case the European Commission, is not clear about what it is they, they require at the outset. So it's hardly a surprise that that, that will change during the course of that and you, as you begin to develop what the specifications and requirements are, clearly the cost is going to go up but that's not down to the IT partner or the Scottish Government or anything else, it's down to the requirements set out, I presume, by the Commission. Um, looking over the course of, I mean, when the system is up and running and, and, and working, will that last us for a period of time? Is, that, is, is there a lifespan attached to that? Is it, is it for as long as the cap reforms are in place until Europe changes, changes them again? I mean, how long will the system stand as in good stead once it is settled down? If I can just take your first point for first, Mr Coffey, I think it is true that some of the increase in costs is due to the way in which the EC requirements have emerged over time. It's also true, as I say in my report, that we think there are some weaknesses in the way in which the programme has been managed and governed that have contributed to those costs. So both are true, and I don't want to suggest it's one or the other. In terms of the lifetime of the programme, the new CAP scheme is a five-year scheme. Um, it is quite possible that parts of the system that's being developed can be used for future iterations. Um, and, for example, one of the ways in which the government is currently looking to contain costs and improve um, the likelihood of successful delivery is to reuse elements of the old land mapping system in the new system. So some of this uh, programme as a whole should be possible to reuse for future iterations of CAP, assuming it continues in something like the current form. Um, some of it may need to change, and I don't think we're in a position to say that at this stage. Do you want to add to that, Mark? Just really to reaffirm that last point, I think uh, we're, we're, we are clear that there's more, work, more audit work to be done here and to understand uh, the progress of the project and some of the detailed uh, uh, governance arrangements and controls that are in place, and we intend to do that work. In, 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 in relation to how long is it for, the business case set out a period which Jim will be able to help us for in a, in a second, and that's what the, the, the spend is based on, is getting benefit over that period of time. If Gemma, you're able to. Yeah. The Futures programme is a five year programme, so it started in 2012 13 um, and was really to deliver both the business change and the IT system to help deliver that business change and to deliver EC requirements over that five year period. We're currently um, 18 months into, into that five year programme. It's, it's potentially managing um, uh, over the five years if it's £700 million pounds a year, I think you mentioned, Auditor General, you're talking about three and a half billion pound programme in the cost of this system. Why we, we want to get it right and, and then on uh, as tight a budget as we can possibly do, but it's managing that kind of size of budget, is it? Yes, I mean, the, on current figures, the amount of money going into Scotland's rural eco economy to farmers and small rural businesses um, will be about three and a half billion over the period. Um, the, the cost of this is the cost of being able to deliver that, uh, but also to, to deliver efficiencies and better customer service and to avoid the risk of regulatory penalties if it goes wrong. So it's an important investment, not just for the, the direct financial costs, but those wider costs and benefits associated with it. Last question, Camilla. Is everybody now totally clear at this point what the requirements are. I mean, software engineers will tell you 
tell us what you want and then we'll build it for you. Uh, is everyone clear now about what the requirements are and is, are they basically getting on with the job? I think everybody is now clear what the EC requirements are and there has been a, a, a very focused piece of work by government to revisit the business, business case and be clear what should be delivered to maximise the chances of successful delivery over the next 18 months. That's not to say there may not be more changes in the way in which it's done. We all know this is the case. Gemma, Mark, I'm not sure if you want to add to, to that general answer. Mark would like to. Uh, I, I, as, as you would understand, Mr Coffey, the, the, a long-term project which will have a number of releases, a number of different parts to it, and the initial focus is on those, easy, those early releases. The initial focus is on getting an application system that allows farmers and other rural businesses to apply for the grant, and I think those, those requirements are now well understood and works progressing on that. The next challenge is then to get the back-end processing in place, which allows those, that data to be processed. I think there's a fair amount of understanding, but the detail of that is still to be worked through, and I don't think that is linked linked entirely to the European regulations. There's a bit, of, a bit of work still to be done around that. The last more general point I'd make, if I, if I could, is that one of the issues we've come across is uh, the challenges that the government have in having the right commercial and contract management skills. We've talked about how the government works with an IT provider, and one of the things they've recognised is they've not been doing that as well as they might have been in terms of getting that clarity and getting that uh, a relationship right with the IT provider. Again, as we go on to do more detailed work, that will be one of our main areas of focus to really understand how that's working. Okay. Look forward to that when you carry out that one. Okay. Thank you. Ken Mantle, please. Uh, thanks, Mr. Convener. Uh, I have to say I read this report with... Uh, it's, it's depressing enough to read about uh, the money that uh, this scheme is now costing and, and no payments have yet been made, but it's, the, I suppose, the depressing familiarity of it all. Um, can I just check... You, the report that we looked at in this committee about managing, you produced managing ICT, that was actually produced uh, in 2012 before this contract was awarded and signed, am I right? Does it, do you think that uh, anybody in charge, of I don't know if you've actually asked them, has anybody in charge of this project actually read your report? Um, I'm going to ask Gemma to come in in a moment. But it's important to set the context, I think, that we're reporting uh, this project to you now because of the risks associated with it and because it arises from the government's 2013-14 accounts. We are also in the process of doing a significant piece of work which is revisiting that 2012 report to look at the way the recommendations have been picked up um, and conveniently Gemma's leading that piece of work as well. Um, the business case for this project does make reference to our report and some of the recommendations in that. Um, I think the themes that were raised in that initial report, certainly ones around ca capacity and capability, are not easy ones to be fixed that quickly. Our report published in the August of 2012, the business case came was approved in, in the December, um, and some of these um, the weaknesses um, that we had um, reported in that report were certainly ones that would not be able to be fixed that quickly, but that would need a, a kind of continuing focus um, to make an improvement. Uh, I, I noticed that you suggest that there's there's uh, increasingly little contingency. Um, what contingency plans does the government have? Uh, are they going to, you know, if this programme is not in place and doesn't work, are they going to go back to manual payments? What's going to happen? Um, the government are looking at a range of contingency options, and I would say that they're very actively looking at contingency options at the moment. They're um, putting a lot of work into that to make to minimise that that risk. Um, to uh, the payments. They are looking at a range of options, so that includes manual processing, it includes using existing systems um, for a little bit longer, um, it includes accelerating certain parts of the, the new build and maybe holding back others, so prioritising what needs to be done, um, and it's also looking at um, standalone existing IT applications that they might be able to use. Okay. There's an app for this, is there? <laughs> Can I just check... Um the, you're talking about they having difficulty filling some of the posts. Is that still the case? That has been a, a constant difficulty um, for the team in filling the posts. They have now um, filled most of the um, certain senior level posts that they had vacant, um, which was around um, programme management um, and contract management. They have now filled those posts. But it has been a difficult um, for the team, and it really relates back, to, I think, to the, the theme that we raised in our 2012 report on managing ICT contracts on that um, capacity and capability across the, the wider Scottish um, government for um, managing IT projects. The programme's only been running for over a year. How many programme directors or IT directors has it had? 
the um, programme has had one consistent S um, senior responsible officer over that period. Mm -hmm. And the IT director or the chief technology officer, has that changed? That has changed. The chief technology officer is quite a new post that has come in. Mm -hmm. Can I just check as well, who's the minister in charge of this programme? The rural affairs is, is, is overall responsible. Yeah. Yes. And uh, as he uh, has this been reported, has he reported on this either to Parliament or to Rural Affairs Committee? Um, I mean, are we the first committee to be aware of this, or are any of the subject committees or is Parliament aware of this? The fact that there's a crisis going on in this programme. I don't think I can answer for any reporting that may have happened to other committees of this Parliament. I thought that it was an appropriate time to report to this committee, given your specific responsibilities for overseeing the use of public money and the value for money that's um, achieved for that. Are you aware of any um, process of accountability of this programme so far? I mean, has it been debated or discussed in the committee at all? Or? I'm not aware of any. That doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Question for the no. Auditor General to uh, reflect on <laughs> committee business in this Parliament. No. Uh, and uh, no, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, it was just a, a very small point on that. I, I, from memory, when we were taking evidence on the managing IC contracts, I seem to remember being given an assurance that what had happened, and you know, the huge increase in uh, 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 cost, but I seem to remember being given an assurance that IT contracts over a certain amount would actually be managed by a team within the government that it wouldn't just be left to public sector organisations, small and large, and that it would be much more professional. Um, can you... Uh, I, I can't remember who that... Uh, and I hope my memory's right, but I do remember being given an assurance that we wouldn't see the likes of Raws and, you know, the other problems we had, uh, Procurator Fiscal's Office, etc., and that a, a team within the government would oversee all these contracts. So two years later, well, A, am I right in my memory? And B, what happened to that team in respect to this contract? I'm going to um, caveat my remarks by saying we are looking at the wider follow-up of those recommendations at the moment, and we're not at the position to report them yet. Having said that, um, the uh, Information Systems Investment Board was an, a new part of the governance arrangements envisaged for large IT contracts, um, and the business case for the programme was approved by that board in December 2012. Um, we hope that has improved some aspects of governance. It's clear to us that some um, problems with governance uh, remain. Um, this committee will be hearing from me over the next few months with problems with other large, t large IT investments. And it seems to me there's something really systematic here, which um, we and the government need to get to grips with, not only because there are often significant unanticipated costs associated with them and benefits not being achieved, but because the wider question of the way in which public services respond to the continuing financial pressures we know are going to be in the system for the foreseeable future must depend on making better and more creative use of ITs, IT and collectively we're not very good at that. So I don't want to preempt the question about how well those recommendations have been responded to other than to say there clearly is still a systemic problem which hasn't been resolved. Do you want to add to that Gemma based on the work you're doing so far or would you rather hold your peace until we're ready to report? <laughs> I think I'd probably rather hold off. I think there are, we've seen elements of um, what the government said they were going to do after our um, 2002, 2012 report come in place, for example, the Information Systems Investment Board um, being yeah. made into a, a significant yeah. part of the governance process for um, IT projects within the Scottish Government. But I think as we follow up um, in the round our recommendations, we can see what um, improvements that has brought to the process. I do find it quite disappointing that uh, you know we were assured that this crack team from government would ensure that the errors of the past wouldn't likely happen in future. And we have a report here today of a programme which will carry, and I quote your uh, paper, will carry significant risk right up until implementation and beyond. Uh, and I did take that uh, assurance that this new government team overseeing contracts would be quite rigid, and I, I put my trust in this. So, uh, on the record, I'm disappointed to see this, uh, and obviously more has to be done. Thank you.
Craig, Bruce Crawford. Can we leave it till we've got time? Six, <coughs> okay. given how much we have our own time. Okay, well, uh, can I thank the Auditor General and her colleagues for uh, their contribution and move on to the next item on the agenda, which is item four, major capital projects. Um, members have had circulated um, the report on the major capital projects. Any comments or questions? Mary? Yeah, uh, uh, just to retain my consistency over the three years I've been on this committee, uh, the two uh, that I would like to mention is uh, the new prison for Highland. Uh, 40 million was allocated in 2009 and we've got 62 million allocated in 2014 and no well, current project status and preparation. So five years later, an increase of uh, 43 million and we're still in preparation. And my second one, convener, which I've raised, I think on all of these occasions, is about the duelling of the A9. And uh, the two projects were uh, the A9 can Craig to Dalradi, and I'm very pleased to see that that's ongoing. But the other more significant part of the duelling that was previously mentioned uh, was Lunkerty to Burnham, and that's disappeared. So I would like a, an update on what's happened to the previous commitment of Lunkerty to Burnham uh, and register my... Uh, 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 just to acknowledge that I'm very pleased that Can Craig to Dalradi, which is about three, four miles, is going ahead. But Lunkerty to Burnham was about 10 to 12 miles from memory, and I think that is the most congested part of the road. So. Uh, we, we can clarify that with the Scottish Government, but there could be a, a number of issues. One might be that um, the amount doesn't meet the minimum um, requirement for reporting. The other is that it's not yet reached the outline business case, but we can... Uh, we can clarify well, that. Well, I can just say the longer to Burnham is three times the length right. of Can Craig to Dalradi, and that's why I mentioned it, right. because it will be, on average, two yeah. to three times so the cost. Well, we can clarify that yeah. with the Scottish Government. Ken McIntosh. Uh, thanks, uh, Convener. Just to clarify a couple of issues, um, this is the new format uh, that we're going to uh, adopt, I think, uh, although... Is my understanding right that we're going to uh, have a session next time, uh, six months' time, with um, the government officers or with either with the ministers or with the, the officials responsible as well? An update June, March 2015. Right. Um, it was just to, just to find out. Clearly, the, the document itself is, is useful. Uh, I'm still slightly concerned about how much it flags up, you know, change and 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 delays and slippage and so on um, I mean we can see some examples here uh, for example uh, just to clarify there, there was one uh, there's Inverness College you might as many examples might know this uh, Inverness College is there but, sorry back page 31 30, 30, 30 31 32 because the way this is um, laid out the government is supposed to flag up in, in the annex the ones in which there is uh, Change. So, for example, Inverness Campus, which I'm assuming is a, is that a Scottish enterprise or Highland Islands, Highlands Enterprise Building, that appears to have slipped from May 2013 to November 2014. So, Inverness Campus isn't the same as Inverness College, which is a separate entry. Yes, Highlands Enterprise has to have an input there, so it is separate. That's fine. Yeah. Now, that, when there are clearly a number um, of uh, um, uh, dates that have slipped and so on, which do emerge towards the back. Uh, I, I'm not 100% convinced, though, of the way it's laid out that that everything is immediately transparent. The one, for example, that I would have question about is the, the, the New Southern General, the South Glasgow Hospitals Project. Um, uh, either page 26, it's also on page... Uh, so page 26, and it's also on another page. It's also on page five, page twenty-six. So, um, the, 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 again, it goes back to my my worry about what what we're seeing about these. Uh, this document seems to give you 
at least some indication of what's happened over the last six months. So that's useful. What it doesn't do is really give you a starting point and an end point. But the Southern General Hospital, I mean, excuse me, but this is obviously etched in my mind because um, it was of quite political, great political significance to me. When it was first um, drawn up and a contract and a decision was made to, to house the new hospital at the Southern, it was estimated at around about 260, 260 million, roughly. Um, this is off the top of my head. About, within about, and it was, it was, the decision was taken on grounds of cost because it was seen as to be something in the region of 10 or 11 million pounds cheaper than another location. Within about a year or so, the cost rose to 300, the estimate rose to about 360 million. In 2007, what happened was that this was going to be procured by, um, uh, or there was something good down the line of producing a public sector comparative figure for an NPD program. And that's where they came up with this figure of 840 million, 841 million. Which is, you know, goes from 260 to 360 to 841, which is a comparative figure, which I assumed was including the cost of NPD. And then it goes back to being a capital, a traditional capital procurement, and yet the cost stays at 841. And I have to be honest with you, I've never quite understood how we made those jumps. I mean, it is three times the original. It's more than three times the original cost. Um, and these these costs were all in the public domain, hugely debated, um, debated intensely in Parliament and in, uh, in the local area where I live. Um, I, I'd like, I mean, this is the sort of thing I'd like further information on about, you know, how did we get to this point? You know, uh, I'm not sure whether it's a question for the government or the Auditor General, uh, but it's the sort of issue I'd like further information on. This, this particular document doesn't really satisfy it. You know, it sort of offers an assurance that, that I don't find, uh, I don't find assuring. And I, was wondering, I was wondering how, for example, how would, I may, how would I be able to pursue my concern about this particular project, as, just as one example? Right. Well, I, I think there's a number of different things. There may well be particular issues that you, you want to follow through uh, as an ordinary member of the, the Scottish Parliament. As far as the committee is concerned, um, it wouldn't be for um, Audit Scotland or the Auditor General, um, I think, to answer those, the specific points you raise. I think that would be for the Scottish Government. You've asked a specific question um, about how the cost went from an, an original figure, then included an amount for in. PD calculations and then reverted back to capital and the figure stayed the same. I think the only way we can get that clarified is to write to um, the accountable officer to ask for clarification on that. So we, we can certainly um, do that. I think the wider issues um, which you may want to pursue yourself um, can then be raised when we have an oral um, report in March 2000 and in 15 and we will have a chance to to come back to, to some of that then so i think there are issues that you might want to pursue we'll ask the specific questions um on that of the the accountable officer okay that's advice to us what we've been asked to do here is look at how this uh, th this is laid out and whether or not we are capable of interpreting this to show significant show enough differences to, to, to flag up for other people effectively. And the government have been on a journey with this committee before I became a member of it, trying to produce improvement after improvement after improvement and how this was laid out. I frankly don't know where else they can go now in terms of producing that improvement uh, and, and more detail without becoming more burdensome than we already require. Because the information from what I can see on the new S South Glasgow Hospital tells you when construction was started. It tells you when it went to market. It gives overall cost. Now it tells you a full business case is available, and that could be s sought out by any member of this committee to look at to see what the variances were. So in general terms, I'm happy with the direction that this is going in terms of a layout. And I could crawl through this and look at every single project as well that's appropriate to my area in my constituency, but that's not my job to do this here. What we can also do is um, ask Audit Scotland for their comments and whether the document um, is an improvement in reporting terms um, and whether it helps us to identify issues. Because, well, except what Bruce Crawford says, you know, it's not necessarily our job to go through 
um, everything with a fine tooth comb at the same time where there are uh, obvious areas of concern that it is appropriate for the audit committee to identify and, and address that. So I think we can also seek comments from Audit Scotland. So for the moment, um, yeah, okay. Uh, the, the other uh, material which uh, goes with this is the, the, the programme that's um, uh, delivered by the Scottish Futures Trust or the Hub projects. Uh, now they're produced online. Again, the difficulty with those information is that it, what, it doesn't, what it doesn't draw attention to is uh, slippage, date, increased cost. That, that's, that's, and that's the fundamental problem. It's not you know, whether or not these are desirable or otherwise. It's just whether or not they're being managed properly. Uh, and I've still got a, a, a problem with these. The, 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 difficulty with, the difficulty with information coming to this committee, uh, it implies in some way that we are either approving or auditing it or you know, uh, giving it some sort of official premature, which I, I just don't think we are in this case. And I, I, I just want to raise my concerns that the, 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 the lack of information, the lack of scrutiny that we are able to uh, apply, and I know the lack of scrutiny the Auditor General is able to apply to these projects. And these, just to round off, we're talking about billions, billions of pounds of uh, public money. No, I, I think it's just what we put on record that what we are not doing uh, in these um, considerations, such as today, is given any imprimatur on whether or not we think that the figures are acceptable, that the progress is acceptable. Um, it's a report which is trying to lay out in a more helpful way progress that's been made. There are a number of, of parliamentary routes um, available to members of other committees to, to also pursue um, some of this information. But where we identify a problem, then we can legitimately ask questions. We will have the opportunity to, to do that at the next oral update in, in March, but it would be wrong to suggest that every time we get this report, it's up to us to go through each individual item, and if nothing is said, then somehow it suggests um, approval or otherwise uh, from this committee. That's not the purpose uh, of, of this. Okay, so I, th I would suggest that with the clarification that we're going to seek from the accountable officer that we um, note the report otherwise. Okay, agreed? Agreed. Right, thank you for that. Um, next item on the agenda is moving into private session. Uh, so.